there now. Amherst oh. Media is here, Jack, and I'm now recording. So you're good to go. Okay. Um, so we're beginning the uh, Amherst Planning Board meeting here at 632. Um, welcome. And this is, you know, December 16th, 2020 uh, meeting based on Governor Bol uh, Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law uh, and signed March uh, 12, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jemsek. And as a chair of the planning board, I'm calling this meeting to order. Again, I already said whatever, well, it was 632. <laughs> Uh, this meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. Board members will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, uh, affirmatively and, and then uh, please place yourself back on mute. Uh, Maria? Maria's here, I know. Oh, here. Yes. Uh, and Tom? Here. Uh, Andrew? Present. Doug? Present. Janet? Here. And Johanna? Here. So we have a full slate tonight. Um, if technical uh, difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Pam know. The session may be uh, suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes uh, will note if this occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute, remute yourself. Ah, that doesn't sound right, but um, opportunity for public comment will be provided during the public uh, general public comment item and other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during a public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom telecon teleconferencing link. And that link is shown uh, 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 right above us there. So uh, the link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting or you can join, go to the uh, planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button. When public comment is solicited, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. So uh, <laughs> residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So um, with that said, we have our agenda. Um, and we have several minutes to approve. We have, it looks like May 6th, October 21st, and November 4th. Is that correct, Chris? That's right. Okay. So um, we can, uh, let's approve these as one bunch, uh, but certainly if there are any comments um, I have to, uh, I'm just queuing up the hands here. Okay, uh, Johanna. I am interested in moving this along quickly, but I feel like I'm gonna vote differently on them. And so for, because I wasn't at the meeting in May. And so if we could do them one by one. Cor that yeah, that's, that, you're right, you're right. Sorry about that. All right. Um, okay, so we have the May, let's, let's uh, present the May 6th minutes there for approval. Um, do I uh, see any, you know? I'll move to approve. Discussion? 
What's that, Johanna? Oh, sorry. Do we need to discuss first, or can we can we go ahead and move? Uh, we we can move and then discuss. I think it's it's we can discuss first or or move. You know, I, I think that's that's flexible. So, um, but you weren't here. <laughs> um, right. So it's Jack, Maria, Janet, and Doug. Did we approve the May sixth minutes? Okay, Doug. Uh, here a second. Second. Okay. okay, Maria. Uh, any discussion? Janet, I thought you were talking, but maybe not. No, I, I made a motion, but I think I was on mute. So. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry All right. about that. Sorry. All right. So uh, we'll do a, a roll call um, on this. So, um, Maria? Approve. Um, and then Janet? I approve. Doug? Aye. And myself approve. So that's five zero for those minutes. Would we just abstain for the? Yeah. And, and yes. I, if, yeah. Sounds good. So uh, Andrew? Uh, abstain. And uh, Johanna? Abstain. And Tom? Abstain. Thank you. So uh, the October 21st minutes, uh, we can discuss, or someone can move to approve the minutes. I move to approve. I second. All right, so uh, that was Doug and, and Janet? Yes. OK. Um, any discussion? Yeah, sorry, I can't get the hand up quickly, but is this the one this is one that we had the revised minutes, is that right? For the October 21st? Yes, I emailed them to you this afternoon with two comments that came in and I think they were oh. both from Janet. They came in at different times. So they're on page five of the um, the one that I mailed to you today. Maybe um, a Pam could bring that up on the screen. I'm gonna try, I was having trouble with that document, hang on. Um, I think, one of the, I, I only mailed one set of corrections today based on my memory of what we talked about. So I'm not sure. I, had I think you might have sent the other comment um, a few weeks ago. Okay, like, that makes sense. Yeah. So the second comment came in earlier and the first comment came in today. Yeah, so this is the one I did today based on my memory. I didn't go back and listen to the meeting and I was confused about whether Doug had raised the what issue and whether Tom had raised it. And I think initially I thought it was Andrew. So if, if everyone can identify themselves, that'd be great. I didn't have time to go back and listen to the recording yeah, today. I, did I? Yeah, I mean, this this is, I, I didn't either, but this, this aligns with my recollection at yeah, least I was, for me. I was just trying to give the gist without like too much. I will say my, my last name has two L's in it. If Pam, if you don't mind changing that. Thanks. Yeah, oh. there, I can see that there's a there's a few editorial things in here. And I will also say too, that when I tried to save this as a PDF for sharing, it just consistently would open in Word. So you're gonna see down here that it looks like it's on page six, but it's because, and I couldn't fix it. I don't know what was going on with the document. Um, but somewhere up here, like page four is practically blank, but yeah. I went through it and this is the correct information. So the final draft will actually look like a normal set of minutes. So when Mr. McDougal said that he, that this aligns with his memory, which one of these paragraphs aligns with his memory? Yeah, my kid. Okay. Only my comment, Chris. I don't remember between Tom and Doug the uh, the, the second or the the first red paragraph. Okay, so I think I must. Uh, okay, so okay, so I have I'm identifying people incorrectly. So, okay. But I, I'm wondering when we talk about 
business hours that the, the management plan for the facility spoke to this. So I'm wondering in terms of business hours, but never mind, never mind. <laughs> let's, just, let's just get these minutes approved. Um, so I was a little confused. Did Ms. Mc, um, McGowan mean to substitute Mr. McDougall's name in the first paragraph that's shown up here, instead of Mr. Long, we would put Mr. McDougall now that you've heard that he feels that he's- Yeah, said yes, something. because I think I'm making the same tw mistake twice or something, and so- then Mr. Marshall also asked a question about lights being downcast except for signs. So this would be the first paragraph in red here is the one you're asking the board to agree with. Yes, and then that's substituting, substituting. Mr. yeah. Yeah. So I just actually the first one, I don't remember the first one. Tom, I, think, I, think, I think that was me. Yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, I think I the think second you were correct, was correct Janet, for me. In yeah. that I I raised the section number from my from reading and um, and then Mr. Marshall followed up on that. Okay. Trust your so I think you're correct here. Yes. I'm I sorry, I'm sorry to get everybody's names confused. I should have just listened to it again. So it's, is, the first correct paragraph, is the first paragraph the one that Janet is putting forward as the correct one? Yes. Yeah, do the first paragraph. Yeah, with the... And the second paragraph, should that be in as well or not? No. So you want this, you only want the first paragraph. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. With the correct, yeah. So we can approve the minutes uh, as with these corrections. Um, any further discussion? Nope. Okay. So we'll do a, a roll call here, Maria. Approve. Tom? Approved. Andrew? Approved. Doug? Approved. Janet? Approved. And Johanna? Approved. Great. Okay. And I approve. So that's some zero. And we have one more from November 4th. So moved. To approve. I Second. found one tiny typo in this. Um, the very beginning, um, my name is misspelled. I don't know that it matters hugely, but that would be the one correction. Where is that? Um, page one, planning board members participating remotely and present by roll call. My first name has an H in it. Sorry, no. Johanna. It's all good. <laughs> Okay, and did someone second the move to approve? Not yet. We got Andrew. Andrew seconds. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay, see no hands raised. Uh, we'll do roll call. Uh, Maria? Approved. Tom? Approved. Andrew? Approved. Doug? Approved. Janet? Approved. And Johanna? Approved. Great, and I do as well. So that's seven zero for those minutes. So um, we have a public comment period. And what do you see out there, uh, Pam? This moment, I am seeing none, but usually I say that and see, yep, one popped up. <laughs> so we have Catherine Appy. Oh, okay. I'm gonna allow to talk. Hi, Catherine. Catherine, can you hear us? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Excellent. I just wanted to, yes, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Catherine Oppie, and I live on Redgate Lane in Amherst. I wanted to make a public comment about uh, the 40R proposal. I strongly support the proposal to bring thoughtful development to downtown Amherst. These plans are the product of a very long and inclusive process. If this proposal is adopted, we have every reason to be confident that it will produce the following results. It will make the downtown a more vibrant and appealing place to visit, both for residents and out of town uh, visitors. It will broaden our tax base, thus reducing the pressure of steadily rising property taxes on individual families. The proposal's requirements for ample sidewalks, setbacks, and protected open spaces will enhance the physical beauty of the town. By creating a more robust downtown, the plan will help to minimize sprawl and other forms of growth that do the most damage to our natural resources. Finally, it will serve a goal most community members have long embraced but have never fully realized. The need for more affordable housing so that we can be a community in which the widest possible variety of people can live and work. I also support the proposal because I respect and trust the people who have committed so much time and effort in to create it. They are extremely gifted and have engaged in an open and inclusive process. Over a number of years, they have sought community input and consulted with a wide variety of experts and stakeholders, including the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance, local community members, and the state. I also support this program because it's not a one-off experiment, but part of a process that has been used with success in over 40 municipalities around the Commonwealth. Our plan has benefited from all that experience and we will also benefit from the state commitment of funds it will bring to this project. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Catherine. Catherine. Um, and we have one other hand up that we can't really identify who that is. So, um, Pam, uh, we can I'm allow gonna, them I'm to gonna talk and at least introduce themselves and make sure they're, you know, Identify right. themselves. Hello. Oh. Hi, this is uh, Matt Blumenfeld from uh, 335 Middle Street in Amherst. Um, sorry, I used to, my, I'm, I'm on my work um, Zoom ID, ID, so that's why I wasn't identified. I uh, see. <clears throat> Hi, Matt. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Yeah. For, thank Matt, you what, for, what did you say your street address was? 335 Middle. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm also calling in to um, uh, urge you to support the uh, 40R uh, district. Um, I'm looking at the uh, overlay right now, and I think it makes tremendous sense uh, in terms of what we want to see in our downtown. Um, I've lived in town for 25 plus years. My office is above Hastings, and I would love to see uh, more dynamism uh, more affordable housing, uh, more activity downtown. And I think uh, 40R does just that. So uh, I won't uh, echo everything that Catherine said. Um, and I just want to say that uh, I urge you to support this initiative. I think it's well thought out and will benefit our town for years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Do we have a few more, Jack? Okay. Yeah. Next, we have um, Sarah LaCour. Sounds good. Hi, Sarah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great, great. Um, thank you for taking uh, public comment. Um, for those of you um, unaware, I'm the former executive director of the Amherst BID and longtime resident of Amherst, um, also a professional landscape architect and planner for many years. Um, a 40R for downtown Amherst is huge. It um, not only provides the opportunity for us to create affordable housing, which is something we've talked about in this community and felt the need for for so long, um, but it also, by creating a 40R district in our downtown, keeping the density there, it protects our open space and the natural resources that are so important to us as well. 
our downtown is uniquely, well, maybe not uniquely, but critically important and a great area to do this. It's on bus stops, not only PBTA are local, but people can get to New York, Boston, Springfield. You know, this is this is a, 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 a regional New England destination area, public transportation, the proximity to uh, services and resources for those um, living in affordable housing. Um, you know, we often we've had you know issues with some of the affordable housing is off our bus routes and is out of town, and people can't access the services and the cultural opportunities that that they would have in downtown. Um, you know, the the civic institutions, the health resources that are relatively new to downtown, all of that is accessible with putting our affordable housing in our downtown and protecting our, our um, natural resources. This is what smart growth is all about. And, you know, we've talked about in Amherst for a long time, creating affordable housing, protecting our resources. This, this is it. This is how we do that. Um, it provides the incentives, um, the state, this is working really well across the state. I'm currently working with it in Ludlow and it's been um, a great success. So I, I just wanted to put my two cents in and encourage you to, to look favorably on this, um, on this great planning tool. So thank you very much for your time. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have what, Jenny? Jenny Hamilton. Hi, Jenny. Jenny, I've enabled you to speak. <clears throat> I think it looks like we have Kent enabled to speak at the moment. And Hello. Jenny, Jenny is still. Yep. OK. So, so do you want to go out of order, Jack? Oh, that's fine. Uh, Kent. Kent, hi. Um, my name is Kent Ferber. I live at 481 Station Road in Amherst. And I've been a thank you very much for all your work for the town, first of all. We, we really appreciate it. And I've been a member, a resident of Amherst for about 43 years. And I love living in Amherst because of its high aspirations. Uh, it wants all kinds of good things in the way of affordable housing, schools, roads, fire and police services, library and the like. But over the years, it's become increasingly clear to me that it's having more and more difficulty affording these. And it, uh, I'm of the, of the view of, of, uh, that's shared by many others. And part of the reason for that is the, the town's heavy dependence upon residential real estate taxes. As long as that represents something, as I understand it, like 90% of the tax revenue of the town, it's going to be difficult to afford that. Commercial development is inevitable, whether we like it or not. So the trick to achieving both the um, normalized tax revenues and the kinds of things that we want seems to me the kind of control, smart growth represented by this 40R overlay district. This is a proven way of controlling that development to our sensibilities, making it do what we want. And so we are, I urge you, <clears throat> to recommend that the uh, overlay district be adopted by the town council. Thank you very much for the chance to be heard. Appreciate that. Thank you, Kent. And Jenny. Is my audio working now? There you go, Jenny. Yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you for your patience. Still figuring out the technology. You think I'd have it down by this point in the pandemic. I'm Ginny Hamilton. I live at 140 Middle Street, and um, I'm echoing many of the statements already um, shared this evening in favor of the 40 R district downtown. Um, I come to this um, actually having worked with 40 R as a board member of the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance back when the program was new about 15 years ago. So 
you know, this program has been around for over 15 years. It's well tested by other municipalities. Um, and we've seen the work that town staff have been doing with the state's 40R process for a few years now. So those state funds, the skill of the consultants you've been able to bring in, um, we've seen that skill in action through the, the draft zoning that you all are looking at now that's in line with the master plan that we have um, guiding the work and the principles. So I will not repeat what others have said, although I share the support for affordable housing, the smart um, use of our resources. Um, and I particularly personally, I appreciate the design standards that mimic blocks like the Hastings building in town rather than continuing the piecemeal development that's been so controversial. So since these design standards reflect the public input um, from the multiple community forums that have gone on, um, I hope you all will um, respect this process. I thank you for the hard work that's been put into it and I hope you'll move this process forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and we have Erica. Hi, Hi Erica. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Erica Zekas and I live at 40. Um, and I also concur. I just wanted to speak um, in favor of the 40R overlay. Um, I feel it's an effective approach in line with our master plan that will support a vibrant downtown, uh, providing a mix of uh, retail and residential people living and shopping in our downtown will create a dynamic mix. Um, and importantly, this zoning change provides an avenue for more of the affordable housing that Hammer's families need so much. Thank you, Thank you Erica. So I see now there are hands raised right. within the public entities there. So Pam, okay. correct? I, I didn't see any more either, Jack. Okay. So I think one last look. Yeah. Good. So uh, looking our, at our agenda, you know, we're nine days from, from Christmas. It's a busy time of year. Um, I don't really want to go real late this evening. Uh, I will not say that every meeting, but generally, <laughs> it seems like I have been saying, but especially tonight. Um, but so we have a lot of, you know, like heavy items on the agenda. And I just thought I'd put some time limits on them. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, we have to get through the, the Kendrick Park uh, you know, addition of, of uh, playground equipment there, no problem. Um, the master plan implementation matrix, I'm wondering if we can just kind of discuss that for like 20 minutes, if, if people feel, you know, that's reasonable. The 40R is, again, with the comments we had, put more into that 30 to say 40 minutes. Um, and then the other one would be uh, the zoning priorities for new business. Um, you know, definitely that deserves 20 minutes, but that that could take us all night um, if we go at it. So I just, it, it'll be our first look. And then the, the comprehensive housing policy is, um, is just emerging. And so, but we need to be introduced, uh, introduced to it, but I don't know that it's worthy of, of much discussion uh, at this point from the planning board, but I would, you know, like to know how we want to approach it as a group. Um, so with that said, uh, we can start the review of the final choices for equipment for the playground at Country Park in accordance with the condition number four, the site plan review decision for SPR 2020-07, Town of Amherst, East uh, Pleasant Street, Kendrick Park Playground. And I think Nate's gonna speak to this. Hi, Jack and planning board. I can, uh, I'm going to share my screen. It can be really quick uh, because um, we've already ordered the equipment. So <laughs> <laughs> the, um, no, thanks for having me back. The, uh, the, uh, the playground was approved earlier this year. Um, you know, there's a whole, um, you know, 
one phase of Kendrick Park. I'm sharing my screen here. So what you're seeing is, you know, all of Kendrick Park in the outline. And then what was approved was um, a play area, some sitting areas and walkways. And so what we're focusing on tonight is really the play equipment and then some site amenities. And the, um, just, to, just to, as a refresher, you know, if you can see the cursor, here's East Pleasant Street. There is an east-west walkway. And then here's the, um, the area that's, you know, will be under construction. Um, it's actually already started. So Public Works already in started installing this pathway. We've chosen a contractor out of Worcester um, and they mobilized uh, on site. I'm not sure how much they'll get done this fall, but this is being funded mostly with a park grant. It's a state grant. Uh, they expect this to be done by June 1st of 2021. They don't offer extensions, although we've asked even with COVID, they, they said they still expect this to be done by June 1st. And so, you know, if, um, because of that, we, you know, that's why some of the equipment was already ordered. So we have to maintain the timeline. And, uh, you know, there's a few things that have still yet to be decided, but the play equipment has been ordered. Uh, we worked with Emmy O'Brien. They're a, a large vendor. They represent a number of companies. So this is just showing the play area. And the way it's designed is there's a two to five year old play structures and then five to 12 year old play structures. There's some freestanding items. Uh, and then there's, you know, some accessible equipment. The, uh, the next picture will show you a, a rendering. And this is looking as if, um, where it says Kendrick Park on the bottom, this is actually where the, I'll call it the East West walkway is. And so we're kind of looking Northeast and the, the palette of the play equipment is the same as Groff Park. So we wanted to keep kind of muted tones, um, browns, greens, uh, light browns. The play surface, what we were seeing here is all rubberized. So there's the, the black is rubberized. It, uh, it's just a different color to, uh, to note, you know, a walkway, but it's also within the fall safe area for some of the equipment. And then the interior is a different color. It's a mixture of uh, tan and black. So it, again, it's very similar to Groff Park, that speckled um, uh, rubberized surface. It's accessible. Uh, it's, you know, it's actually what Massachusetts will require, I think, next year as one of the only play surfaces because it is fully accessible. Uh, this spinner we see here is at grade and it spins and it's also someone in a wheelchair or other mobility devices can get into it. There's other, um, they said some freestanding items that can be played with so you don't have to necessarily be on the play equipment. And then there are a variety of different options within each, uh, each structure. So there's, you know, ground level things, there's climbing, there's slides, there's, uh, you know, platforms you can get onto or, or you know, reach. So again, here's another view just showing the different equipment. Here's another perspective showing this is the two to five year old up front. And then the five to 12 year old is in the back. It's a much larger structure. Uh, there's a rocker, a spinner. And so that's, that's, that's it for the playground. Uh, in, in terms of the site amenities, we're going with the style bench we used at, um, at Groff and it's similar to the rest of some areas of downtown, but it's all metal. Uh, the color will be kind of a light, they call it Sudan, but it's a kind of a tannish color. Uh, these are the round tables. So within the sitting area on the park, there's three or four tables. And so we've already ordered these. These are some that we've seen downtown now that we the town put out in the summer and they'll be repurposed and used at Kendrick. So they're all one unit with four chairs or three chairs. There's one that will have an accessible seat, a companion seating area. The trash receptacles are the same as what's um, downtown. It's this black. It'll be half recycling, half trash. There'll be a few of those at the park. Uh, I mentioned the rubberized surface. Um, I guess we'll keep going. There's a possible um, sign design uh, before we get to that, I just want to say around the perimeter of this park, there will be granite curbing in some spots and granite walls. So in addition to this playground equipment uh, and manufactured equipment, there is uh, granite curbing and walls. There are boulders and there'll be logs 
on this east side here as kind of a natural play area. So those are things that, you know, I haven't shown here. It was during the site plan review decision or uh, review. Um, and those are things that will be supplied by the town and the contractor both during construction next spring. In terms of the sign for Kendrick Park, uh, in the plans we've shown one with granite posts and then, uh, you know, a sign board inside. And so we'd, we'd have the sign be small enough, you know, less than 12 square feet and less than four feet in height. So it doesn't need to be, you know, complies with the site plan review uh, regulations. Uh, the town has also been installing kiosks uh, at the recreation areas and conservation areas. They're timber framed. They can have a roof or not have a roof. And then they have uh, the ability to have a, a poster board. Uh, so there's a internal team working with Kendrick Park and it hasn't been decided yet what what would be the preferable sign and so um, you know that's something that like I said we're still considering there there's one more um, yeah so I think I think that's it uh, for now if um, I was going to show one more one more picture so, so Nate, you're, you're, you're talking about either the, the kiosk style or the stone monument stone style. Yeah. And the okay. kiosk would not have a roof. We'd have a, you know, just a post with copper caps and then a sign board. The, the sign itself, uh, sorry for all the scrolling is going to go back right here in this, there's a landscaped Island as you're walking in, along the path. So it's a, it'll be a two-sided sign right here. And so on the front of the sign, we'll say something like, welcome to Kendrick Park. Uh, you know, um, we have to, um, we'll recognize the Community Preservation Act. They helped fund this as did the park grant. And then on the back side of the sign would be rules and regulations and playground safety uh, requirements. So the manufacturers recommend having some signage about, you know, not to jump off the top of the slide or something. So they provide, uh, you know, language for that. And so it would be, you know, just one sign right here. Uh, and, you know, it's not necessarily for the, all, the entirety of Kendrick Park. It's really specific to this play area and this, this new park area. Thank you, Nate. Um, I see Chris uh, has her hand up. I, I would like to ask Nate to describe the naturalized play area to the uh, east of the um, more um, manufactured play area, because I think that was something that um, some people really wanted to have. And I think that the designer made an effort to put that in. So Nate did say a few words about that, but I wondered if he could just describe it a little bit more. It's um, again, towards the east side of, of the main play area. Sure. Yeah. If, if, if people can see my cursor, you know, here's the, the east-west walkway. This is going to be paved in asphalt. And then here is the the play area with the rubberized surface as a, you know, it also acts as a perimeter walk. And if we go further along in the playground area or in this, this development area, there's, there'll be uh, another walkway and all of this is accessible. So it creates an accessible loop walkway. There's areas where benches are pulled off to the walkway here. There's benches here. And then there's a, st um, a pebble area. So this is just keystone uh, gravel with granite blocks around. So this becomes, you know, just another tactile area for play. Uh, if we come along the path here, there's an amphitheater. Uh, there's a there's grade change, so it slopes up. So this is a little natural um, slope. There's an amphitheater here. In this area right here, although it's not shown, there um, there'll be earthen mounds, two or three earthen mounds, you know, a few feet in height. Just again, um, you know, using natural grass and earth just for for play area. And then the naturalized play area down in here will be. Um, uh, covered in, in mulch, um, wood fibers, and there'll be um, a series of boulders and rocks. Uh, there'll be a large granite block from Public Works that kids can climb on, and then there'll be um, stumps that are um, placed anywhere from 12 to 24 inches high, you know, vertical stumps that are buried, and then there'll be logs that are, um, you know, secured to the ground that kids can climb on. And so the exact design of that isn't uh, determined. We have different different pieces in the town will work with the contractor in the spring, but there will be, you know, a fairly uh, large area that is uh, mulch and have different elements 
um, in addition to the to the you know manufactured play area. Thank you. Uh, so we'll open this up uh, to the board and I see uh, Johanna. Thanks so much for this presentation, Nate. This is really exciting. Um, I had two questions as I was reviewing this. The first was there was the there was mention of the pollinator garden. So I was just curious what the location of that was and the current thinking. And then secondly, it seems like it's pretty well contained in the center of the park. And I know that there was some discussion about fencing or you right. know, just building, I don't know, living fences potentially to make sure, you know, kids don't accidentally run off into the road, but I'd love to just hear the latest on the thinking there. Oh, sure. The, um, in terms of the water, we did bring a hydrant to the site. And so there isn't any water right now at Kendrick. So there's a hydrant now uh, right, right around here. Um, in terms of the pollinator gardens, the original thought was to have them on either side of the amphitheater and then in certain areas, um, you know, acting as both, you know, there's a, a drainage swale here. So the dotted lines are, are perforated pipe for drainage that'll then go to an overflow here. But this is all, this is above this will be a, a, a garden and a drainage swale. So the idea would be to have, have that be planted. Um, we're still thinking of that, you know, we're working with Alan Warren, the, um, Alan Snow, the tree warden and Paul Deffy or Public Works to come up with plant selection. And so, we still want to do some type of pollinator garden. I guess the difficulty is in um, you know watering it and maintaining it, but there is still still some thought of having you know annuals or different types of vegetation here. Um, in terms of fencing, this is North Pleasant Street. So along this walkway here, there behind it will be um, layers of both um, ground cover, then rhododendrons or you know kind of shrubs, and then trees. And so with the curbing, granite blocks, and then you know vegetation, there is a pretty strong backing here, uh, the you know, when you're closest to the street. In terms of East Pleasant Street, you know, there is, you know, a fair amount of distance. And then there's, again, there's an, a series of benches and blocks. And then, you know, we can use the overturned stumps and trees to create some type of barrier. But there isn't, you know, we're not putting a fence or anything. Um, you know, I mean, as, the, as it is now, there is, you know, it's, it's completely open. And so if kids picnic there with their families, there's, you know, there's the ability to wander. Thank you. Um, Johanna, does that? Yeah, it's great. That's Good. exactly okay. the information All right, I'm sorry. curious to hear. Thank you. Uh, Andrew? Thank you. Uh, my question is real quick. Just, I was curious, how tall is that climbing structure? Like, I would be excited about it. I just, I, I'm I'm curious, like uh, if you go to one of the the renderings, that's so that, this yeah. one right here. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I uh, I don't have the specifics, you know, right now in front of me. If we're we're assuming that's you know about a five foot tall person, so it looks like it could be about um, you know twelve feet to the top, maybe. But I don't I don't know. You know, I, I'd have to look exactly on the specifications. Okay. Yeah, I was, I mean, I'm just sort of curious whether um, there are some acceptable standards or also just like how the town is protected in case of uh, any accidental injury. Right. So you can see here in this rendering, you know, someone, there's the, you know, someone could walk across up here, but the height of the next, there's, no, you know, if you call these like a, a, la, um, a wire rung, like a ladder, you know, they're, you're not meant to get on top of this. You know, I'm sure there'll be some daring kids. Uh, uh, every <laughs> <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. That's what I would try. Yeah, so, to. so you know, the 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 playground manufacturers, they, um, you know, they put their stamp of approval on this, and so the rubberized surface will have to be padded enough. You know, they have to under. You know, they've already assumed that liability, and then when we post the rules and regulations on the back of the sign, that I think will cover us. Uh, you know, there is some some risk here, right? So there's some level of risk and responsibility with the users, but there should be, you know, we're assured by the playground manufacturers that this meets all the safety standards. So, you know, if someone does get hurt, you know, if they fall, it depends. I mean, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but we'd have to then, you know, see what, see what recourse there is. Yeah, no, understood. Thank you. Looks, uh, looks really good. Appreciate the presentation. Okay. And uh, Tom, please. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Nate. Thanks for the presentation. Excited to get this in downtown. Looks fantastic. Uh, I just had a quick question about the signage and whether that would be presented to the design review board for approval. It, it had been presented to the design review board and we said we'd go back um, once we had something finalized as well. And so- Okay, because I saw two versions, yeah. Right, yeah, no, you're right. And so, you know, I was gonna have a new share. Um, what we had been looking at in terms of signs, you know, here's Amherst Golf Club. So here's, you know, what a granite post would look like. We wouldn't have a stone um, sign display area. <laughs> uh, you know, unless someone wants to donate that. Um, and then here's, um, here's what a kiosk looks like. And so, you know, the, the team I think is leaning toward the granite posts. Uh, you know, we were at one point we were thinking about trying to have a consistent design throughout town, but I mean, these kiosks, uh, you know, maybe more appropriate for recreation areas and conservation areas and less so for a downtown park. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's yet to be determined, but if you have any comments or feedback, no, I'm, I'm on the design review board, so I was looking forward to seeing it there. Okay. <laughs> uh, Nate, that, what's uh, Sweetser Park have? Is that the right name? <laughs> Sweetser, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't know if there, there's an old, stock, there's, in the corner, there's a, you know, one of the old wayfinding signs or markers from the, the town has on the corner of Lessie and Main Street, but in terms of an actual sign, uh, there isn't a sign, you know, there isn't a more formal sign at Sweetser right now. Oh. If I, if I'm, if my memory's correct. I think the more formal sign downtown would look more appropriate potentially than the kiosk sign, but this is my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I think some staff felt the same way once we saw the actual image of what the kiosk looks like. Yeah. Okay. But I think that Amherst Golf Club sign is like, looks just, it's amazing. <laughs> but you know conflict of interest conflict of interest right here but uh <laughs> um so uh chris you have your hand up yeah i just wanted to um respond to those uh, questions about safety of the equipment and one of the reasons why we chose manufactured um, equipment for the larger area of play was because when these manufacturers design these things, they design them with um, safety in mind because they don't want to be sued for injuries. So they try to make them as safe as possible for the general public. And that's why rather than having the whole playground be natural, which is what many um, members of the public were thinking that it could be, um, we went in this direction. First of all, these, these things, many of them are accessible to children who have handicaps, but on the other end, at the same time, um, they are, you know, tested and um, they're about as safe as you can get and still have some fun. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Andrew? Only only because you asked, Nate, that I, I actually like the, the um, the non-granite sign, only in that I could imagine this might be a meetup space for, for parents and like to the extent that that could serve as sort of a bulletin board. I know some of those types of um, uh, signs will have opportunities for like people to leave messages, like right. that might be something worth considering, but again, only because you asked. No, sure, thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I don't see any other hands up. Um, we open this up. Uh, any public comment? Pam Rooney. Hello, thanks. Um, as I was watching and listening to the presentation, um, I'm sort of thinking as a landscape architect, what the bigger safety concerns might be. The nice sidewalk that's gone in, the asphalt that's there uh, spills out to East Pleasant, East Pleasant Street, but there does not seem to be any intention of safely directing people across East Pleasant Street. And I wonder if you could address um, what provision, provisions there are going to be for uh, people once they get to East Pleasant Street. Thanks. 
Yeah, I do, but I believe that was already addressed during the initial acceptance of the project. But Nate, if you would review that, be appreciated. Uh, so for East Pleasant Street, I mean, there's an existing sidewalk now along East Pleasant Street and the walkway will just enter here. So there's not, um, you know, there had been, a, you know, there'll be um, bike stations and benches, you know, we're not thinking about actually, you know, creating any type of barrier here. Uh, you know, this will just be an open, you know, in a continuation of the sidewalks downtown. So, uh, I think, know. excuse me, my, my question was more because it would be kind of a mid block crossing if people come to the street and they in fact were sort of using using this new sidewalk as a cut across from from Halleck and McClellan and they cut through the park on the on the sidewalk they, they're sort of faced with no opportunity to get across East Pleasant Street. Um, I would I would say that we've already kind of gone over this and I, I know Chris helped me out here but I, I don't know that this is really a subject for discussion of what is being presented today. Well, your discussion today focuses on the equipment, but I will say that there is an overall plan for the park. And um, I think Pam may have been part of the group that developed that plan. I don't really remember, but um, it is on our town website and it does show that there is a proposal for a crosswalk um, roughly, you know, or third to a halfway up Kendrick Park crossing over East Pleasant Street. Um, we don't show it on our plan because it wasn't really part of our project, but there is an intention to do that. And it's really um, up to the DPW and the town council to work out exactly where that crossing is going to be. But if you look on our town website and you look um, for the Kendrick Park um, concept plan, I think there's lots of information about that. And that will show where there's a crosswalk um, thought about for East Pleasant Street. Super, thank you very much, that's good. Yeah, thank sorry you. I misunderstood the question. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Guilford Mooring, the superintendent, uh, superintendent of public works, you know, has said sometimes if there's, you know, there's a, there had been a crosswalk right in front of Bertucci's and so somewhat uh, pretty close to where this entrance is here, but he's always said that if, you know, if we, if there ends up being a, an issue with where people are crossing, we can always investigate and assess whether or not there needs to be a, you know, uh, measures taken. So, thank you, Nate. Any other comment from the board? I see Janet's hand. Yes, Janet. So that that actually reminds me of a comment or a question I had asked Nate about a raised crosswalk there, because I think that families will be trying to enter the park crossing that street, which is much busier than North Pleasant Street, and so I think. Um, that, that conversation I think is a good one because even if it's painted on, we know that by the end of the winter, nobody can see it, you know, for whatever reason. And so I, I really would put a pitch in for a raised crosswalk so the traffic will slow down. It's probably not going too fast, but you know, you can't guarantee it um, coming out of the roundabout, but it would, people would slow down for that as they're driving by and because kids will be crossing there to get into the park and come out and hopefully grabbing some food and things like that. So I would just put a pitch in to Nate for, to really put a serious look at that and not wait until somebody's injured, you know, some little kid or someone who's just crossing and stuff like that. It's gonna be drawing people in and let's just, you know, let's just share the road with the pedestrians too. So thank you. Sure, thanks. So on that, I, I thought we were moving away from the Rays crosswalks because they, they don't stand up uh, to the, the wear and tear is that yeah i think you can do it so that the plows go over it and it's not so high it's kind of more of like a blanket and so um or actually you could put a surface down that's like a plasticized surface that is like creates like a um um kind of when the cars go over it it's kind of um you can feel it when you're driving it and you can see it more than just paint so there's lots of options but i, I think something has to mark where people are going to go and then some drivers can see that and feel that and slow down yeah, so Chris, can you, I, I just, what's the current thinking? It depends on where it is. Um, we have a raised crosswalk in front of the Jones Library and that works really well. Um, there are considerations for drainage. If you have a raised crosswalk, then sometimes you have to add mm -hmm. some catch basins. So 
Um, they do become a little more complicated than the regular kind, but this may be a, a good location to consider a raised crosswalk. And that's something that we will bring up with the DPW when we're talking to them about this project. Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and other hands raised, I don't see. So uh, no further discussion, someone to make. Uh... Sure, Mr. Marshall raised his hand. Oh, okay. Doug? Yeah, I, um, I was sitting there looking at Nate's screen share and had a kind of a off topic question. I'm glad I'm the last. Uh, how did you decide what order to, to list the town councilors? It's, it's clearly not alphabetical. I'd have to look at that again. Uh, it's the DPW's you know, fault. Blame it on the DPW. I can't, I, you know, I, it's not clear if, it, if it's age or height or some <laughs> pre precinct order. I don't, I don't know. That's a good, good. Uh... <laughs> okay. Well, I, thanks. Thanks a lot. Doug, your, your, your level of scrutiny is, uh, should be commended. <laughs> The first three are at large members, right? The second yeah. two or the second ones are uh, district one. So it probably was in terms of district members. <laughs> yeah, district, yeah, all right. So we will be uh, up for, uh, you know, proving the, the playground structures, the, the sidewalk is still to be determined. The sign is still to be determined, correct? Uh, just the, the, you know, the sign is, I think um, you said sidewalk, Jack, or you? Well, the, oh, the, the, crosswalk, the crosswalk, the discussion. Uh, but I thought the sign was, was still. It is right. The sign at. is, yeah. We're, okay. we, I'd like to make a decision on the sign, you know, in the next month or so, uh, just so we can get that fabricated and shopped around. Okay. So, uh, Andrew. Yeah, does the sign count as a site furnishing? I'm just wondering if that's the case, can we actually move on this? It just says once final choices for play equipment and site furnishings have been made. Yeah, I'm assuming the sign was part of the site furnishings. But you could exclude that from your vote. You could say everything yeah. except the sign. I, I'm, I'm fine with that. And then, but that would mean we'd get another visit with the sign and at a future meeting. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, any further discussion on the board? Um, anyone want to make a motion? Andrew? So moved. Okay. Uh, is second? I'll second. This is Johanna. Johanna. Okay. Any further discussion? I see no hands. Uh, so we'll do roll call. And Maria. Approved. Tom. Approved. Andrew. Approved. Doug. Aye. Janet. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And myself as a yes. So that's 7 0 for zero for, for that uh, proposal. Jack, the motion excludes the sign. Is that correct? Yes. Correct, Nate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. Right. We'll, we'll wow you with a, a sign. We'll come back. With You're going to come back? One, we, we just love seeing you here, Nate. So yeah, no, we're thanks. looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a, a nice agenda tonight. I'm, you know, I'd like to stick around, but. Right. <laughs> Andrew will take your comments about the sign too. I mean, I think there's, it's, it, yeah, it'd be nice to have the ability to have some area where you can either post things or even if we had, um, we talked about having a locust map and showing other destinations downtown so people could place themselves and know where there's either public restrooms or parking or shops and restaurants. So, you know, we've had different comments about how to make the sign more than just a, you know, a welcome sign. Thanks, Nate. Thank you, Nate. Thanks. Great. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, on next on the agenda is the master plan 
implementation matrix. And it has some girth to it. Um, again, I, I mentioned not going you know too far into it, but let's I, I, I this is this is exciting because in lieu of the zoning subcommittee, you know we talked about doing these types of things. So this is uh, I think it's great that that it's being presented and, and then all of us can discuss. but obviously, um, there's a lot here and we'll rely, I, I presume, on, on Doug and, and Chris to give us an update on this. Shall I start? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. So why don't we just go through like a couple of pages of this and you can see what we did. It was essentially um, Doug and I met probably, I don't know, six or seven hours at different times. And Doug was great because he had this matrix all ready to go and he typed and he corrected me and he added things and, and I talked. So it was a good collaboration. And, um, you know, I just kind of talked off the top of my head about things that I knew that had happened in the last 10 years or hadn't happened. So the goal was to figure out which of the strategies had actually been implemented and which hadn't been. And also to talk a little about which ones were worthwhile to um, continue to try to figure out how to make them happen and which ones could we put aside because things had changed in the last 10 years. So I'll just go through a couple of the pages of the, um, the land use section, which is the one we started with. And that's really the most, in my mind, it's the most interesting because that's the one that we deal with as planners and um, planning board members. So um, the first section is um, says preferentially direct future development to existing built up areas. And we were already talking about that a bit tonight with our, um, with our listening, we weren't talking about it, but the members of the public were talking about it with regard to 40R and potentially putting the 40R in an already developed part of town. So the idea there is if you build up already built up areas, then you can save your um, open space uh, for, for so, recreation. Uh, Chris, I'm, great question. I'm, I'm just looking at what was in our packet. Yeah. And Okay, so you, I, I'm just wondering if I'm looking at the same thing. Uh, LU1A, is that what you're on? I was LU1. looking at LU1, which is the title. Of oh, that okay. Section. So okay. everything that happens after that is under that um, title of LU1, preferentially direct future development to existing built up areas. So the first one was inventory and identify existing developed areas that are appropriate for density increases and redevelopment. So we certainly made progress in developing a, a GIS database, which we didn't really have, um, or at least it wasn't widely available and widely used when the, um, when the master plan was done. And the GIS shows us clearly where development has occurred. Um, we haven't really inventoried areas of, of where development has occurred in any other way. Uh, but we have inventoried areas where development hasn't occurred, and that is contained in the open space and recreation, recreation plan. Um, the town is either, either has done or will soon do a flyover of the town to generate a new GIS base. And the old GIS base, I think, is from 2009. So it's about time to do a new flyover and see exactly where development has occurred. But for the most part, development has occurred in already developed areas with the possible exception of Amherst Fields, Amherst Hills, and um, Amherst Woods, and um, some smaller subdivisions around town. The second one, LU1B, evaluate built up areas on the basis of character, quality, and priority, identifying areas to emphasize preservation, historic areas of the downtown and village centers, Emphasize adaptive reuse, particularly high quality historic areas of the downtown. Allow a varying combination of preservation and redevelopment, such as other village centers, transitional or neighborhood business areas, 
and allow more extensive development and redevelopment with a balance of incentives and controls, such as highway, commercial corridors, research parks, et cetera, and encourage denser development of appropriate scale and design in village centers and downtown. So in, with regard to the uh, first one, um, historic preservation, we've established two historic districts in town um, two local historic districts. Of course, we have the National Register Historic Districts, but we've established two local historic districts, one um, in the Dickinson area, Emily Dickinson Museum area, and one in the Lincoln Sunset area. So that went a long way to um, try to preserve some of our historical uh, buildings. Um, we do have a few unused historic buildings, but unlike you know Holyoke and Northampton, we really don't have big mill buildings or big hospital buildings or anything like that. But we do have some uh, smaller historic buildings such as the Chevy dealership on Dickinson Street that was turned into uh, Amherst College um, facilities, uh, a facilities building. So they're, they base their facilities department out of there. Um, the Baptist Church on Pleasant Street was on South Pleasant Street was turned into an Amherst College office building. And the North Amherst Fire Station was converted to residences. And the, where I'm talking about the small North Amherst Fire Station on Pine Street. It's very tiny. You probably wouldn't even notice it if you hadn't known it was a fire station previously, but that is now a residence. Mm -hmm. um, North Amherst School was converted to a preschool and a storage area for, for the town. And um, Cinda Jones turned a barn into a satellite of, for the Atkins Farm Market. That doesn't really operate anymore, but it's currently being used, I believe, by Provisions, which is a new um, commercial establishment that's moving into North Amherst. Um, and in Pomeroy Center, two existing historic houses were turned into office use, and those are on Ron Lavertier's property, um, just opposite where Moan and Dove is. So those are examples of adaptive reuse of, of historic buildings. And then um, with responding to uh, ex, uh, some of the other items in that um, in that section, University Drive. We've changed zoning from only BL along University Drive to include um, an R and D overlay district, which allows um, some of the spinoff companies from UMass to uh, operate in in those buildings that exist there now. And if new buildings were built there. Uh, they could also operate that there. And that includes laboratories and manufacturing. So that was, that was a big change. Um, we also changed the zoning of the west side of University Drive from OP, Office Park, to BL, Limited Business, to allow more flexible development. And that resulted in Barry Roberts' mixed-use development at 70 University Drive. Um, and we reinterpreted zoning in the PRP zoning district where there were a lot of non-conforming uses that um, allowed residential use to occur there. So one of the um, projects that resulted from that, and that was really um, the building commissioner and um, came, came up with that idea, I think. Um, Amherst Motel uh, was a non-conforming building. It was very unused and a kind of an eyesore, and that's being in, converted to apartments. It's a, it's a building that's currently under construction, it's behind Domino's on Route 9. And um, at the same time, there's an, a new mixed use building going in at the corner of University Drive and Route 9, um, where University Drive South is gonna be located. It's, I think it's got 45 apartment building, uh, apartments in it and um, an, an eye doctor's office. So instead of a single family house at that location, we're gonna have, um, a nice building with affordable units in it as well. And then um, the last one encouraged denser development of appropriate scale and design in village centers. Um, the town supported Cinda Jones and the Beacon communities in their project to create 130 housing units, including 26 affordable units under a chapter 40 B development, including 22,000 square feet of commercial space. So I think, you know, all told, we've really done a lot to um, implement this particular section of the master plan. Um, the next one is LU1C, use flexible zoning techniques such as form-based codes to promote mixed-use development. 
Um, well, town meeting rejected form-based zoning for North Amherst and At Atkins Village Center, um, but we're now re-exploring form-based code via the chapter 40R zoning. So, um, so that's coming back to life again. Um, LU1D undertake rezoning efforts in order to direct more intensive development to appropriate areas and limit developments in resource areas. So um, we have a farmland conservation overlay district that requires cluster development when residential development occurs in a farmland conservation area. Um, and that what that means is that the houses, well, you've all seen it happen down at um, Vista Terrace, farm, um, what is it, Hartwell Farms, um, formerly called Applebrook. And that, um, that development has eight, uh, eight houses and they're all clustered together. And the developer of that property is, um, is giving, I think it's a seven acre parcel to the town of Amherst as a recreation and conservation area. <clears throat> um, so that concentrated development and maximized open space. Um, another thing is we're allowing five-story buildings downtown by right, which allows denser development of the downtown. And along about the same time, around 2010, maybe um, slightly after that, we eliminated the requirement for additional lot area per dwelling unit in downtown, which now allows residential and mixed-use buildings in the downtown, which is a change from uh, previous years. So I don't know how many, uh, how much of this you want me to keep going through. Well, uh, you, we've got we've got some time. Uh, why don't we go through the all the LU one? Okay. Uh, up to LU one J. Okay. Um, LU one E create incentive zoning with bonuses for well-designed infill redevelopment projects. We have not done that. Nope, we haven't, uh, we haven't approached that one. Um, LU1F, provide incentives, including density bonuses to encourage energy efficient development. We do not have density bonuses for energy efficient efficiency, but we do offer um, density bonuses for affordable units um, in cluster developments. And um, Misty Meadows on Tamarack Drive utilize this particular uh, section of the bylaw, um, but that has to do with affordable units and not with energy efficient units. Um, LU1G, establish programs to encourage economic development in existing developed areas, such as economic opportunity areas. Um, we do have an opportunity zone in North Amherst and certain types of development receive tax benefits in that area. We also had, um, Prior to 2010, we we had we helped Atkins Farm Market with an economic development uh, economic economic opportunity area. But since then, there really haven't been too many of those. I think um, Laverdier's property on Larkspur Drive may also have benefited from that. But there hasn't really been too much talk about economic development areas other than the Opportunity Zone, which is a federal uh, designation. So we did take advantage of that. Um, but there hasn't really been any development done as a result of that yet. Um, LU1H, provide incentives to encourage infill and redevelopment. Um, I don't think we have uh, made progress there, but we do have a tax incentive for creating affordable units. So you could argue that that is, um, that is going towards this strategy. Um, the only time that tax incentive has been used was by the Beacon communities at the North Square in, in North Amherst. Um, LU1I, reduce energy use by encouraging new residences near supporting goods and services. So when we removed lot area requirements for residential developments and allowed higher buildings in the downtown, we did uh, take some steps towards um, implementing this particular strategy. Um, and we changed the zoning on University Drive to allow residential development there. University Drive already has a lot of services and it has a bus, um, a bus route. And so it was, a, it was a smart move to change the zoning there to allow residential use in that, um, in that area. LU1J, create market or other mechanisms for transfer of development rights. 
otherwise known as TDRs, from key resource areas and agricultural lands to village centers, downtown, and other areas where denser development is more appropriate. So we did uh, have a project. It was actually, um, what do they call it? A, oh, a DLTA project with PVPC. And the, um, the acronym is escaping me, but it was something to the effect of local technical assistance. Um, anyway, we That's worked right. with Pioneer Valley Planning <laughs> Commission. That's right, yeah. Uh, district local technical assistance. That's it. All right. So yes. we worked with um, PVPC on this. And we got pretty far with it, but then we didn't really have any public, um, what should I say, uh, support for it. Nobody was interested in doing this. They didn't want to transfer development rights from outlying areas to um, the village centers. And this was back probably shortly after the master plan was, was completed. I think it was particularly a sensitive topic in North Amherst because people envisioned that the North Amherst Village Center might become over, overdeveloped as a result of this. So they didn't really um, want to do this. I think there were landowners in the outlying areas who were would have been happy to sell their development rights to um, places in the village centers, but there weren't there wasn't a popular support, public support for the village centers receiving those development rights. So that, uh, that was sort of, um, we made a try at that and it was not successful. It has been successful in some other towns and maybe we'll go back to it again at some point, but right now it doesn't really seem to have much, um, much appeal. So shall I stop there? Yes, sounds great. Um, very good. So let's, uh, let's have uh, some discussion amongst the board on what has been reviewed. And um, I'm looking at hands, Andrew. Thanks, Jack, and thanks, Chris, and Doug as well for putting this together. It's it, it's it's an impressive document. Um, I was curious of a couple things. One, um, the last one you mentioned, you know, given some of the feedback we were hearing relative to 40R, and and given this has been a conversation of late, when we when when we identify no progress on here. Um, you know, do we want to uh, do we want to consider revisiting some of these? Like, how, how do we sort of go to the next step? Because um, certainly, when you mentioned, you know, that this was maybe back in the 2010 timeframe, uh, again, given what we've heard about today, maybe there's some more interest in in resurrecting something like this. Um, and then also, I was just curious, since since um, you know you've you've been along the ride for a long time, Chris is. Um, what's your general sense of like all we've accomplished? It's obviously, obviously a very large list and, and lots on here. Do you feel like we've, we've met your expectations, exceeded your expectations? I uh, would love, love your professional opinion. I was surprised at how many things we had actually accomplished because um, you know, we haven't really looked back at this list until now. And so I was pleasantly surprised to see how many things we had accomplished, but there is more to still be accomplished. So um, does that answer your question? The, the, yeah, the second one, and then I guess the first more broadly for the, for the planning board is, um, you know, what's next, right? As, as we look through some of these, do we want to resurrect them? Um, you know, at what point are we willing to say that like that's done? So I was just, uh, the master plan came out in what year? 2010. 2010. I mean, looking at this compared to say that the 10 years prior to 2010, it was like crickets. Uh, so I think, I think the town and the planning department has done a fabulous job with the charge, you know, presented to them, you know, with this master plan. Um, my opinion, but um, sorry, let me look at other, uh, Tom. Hey, thanks. Um, and thank you, Doug and Chris for this. It is really a tremendous document. And I, and I agree, you know, hearing um, from, from Jack and Chris about progress, you know, over the last 10 years versus the 10 prior, I can only imagine how much was accomplished. 
Um, I think my question is similar to that of, uh, of Andrew's in the sense that a lot of these things are actions that we're doing and that we're documenting those actions, but have they, how do we benchmark results, right? So how do we actually evaluate these things to say, we've done this thing or we've incentivized this or we've moved towards this or started this process. How do we evaluate whether that's done or completed or it did its job? And then maybe something we want to incorporate in the future. So I guess, you know, if, if like for instance, within the master plan, there's some really great things and, and some of these, you know, building an opportunity zone is excellent. How many do we need to make serious change, right? And when are we done building opportunity zones? And how do we evaluate the success of that to say, we need more of those? I guess it's kind of what I'm asking. And that's just more for us to start thinking about and, you know, trying to come up with a process for us as we go through the rest of this document over the course of the next, you know, a few weeks, thinking about ways that we can start to I guess, assess these things, um, evaluate them and think about how we move them forward. Well, um, which which part of that? Sure. Well, wait, but I did the opportunity zone thing. Where, where is that um, in our that list? Was, it was just an example. It was LU1G. Uh, 1G, okay. Just as an example, like we made one, right? But how many is what we need or how, how, how valuable was that one? You know, how much improvement came out? Okay. Of I actually underlined that and uh, I forgot. <laughs> uh, Chris. So I wanted to say that that particular, um, what action um, has not borne fruit and it's kind of a, an odd duck. It was set up by the um, federal government in the last few years. It has a limited time span and we're about I don't know, a third to a halfway through that time span. I think it's got a 10 year time span. And in, initially we had a lot of interest in, uh, from developers, um, but they were mostly interested in projects that were already shovel ready and they wanted to jump in and invest in them. What it does is it gives investors a way of um, not having to pay taxes on capital gains. So they can invest their capital gains in certain types of proje projects and then if they hold the um, investment for long enough, and I think 10 years is, is one time of frame, um, they don't have to pay taxes on their capital gains. So there's a lot of incentive to get into that early on, but um, when people found out that there weren't really shovel ready projects to invest in, um, it seems like they've kind of lost interest in it. So I would say the opportunity zone, although it seemed um, very worthwhile in the beginning was probably not as worthwhile as we hoped it would be. On the other hand, it covered a huge portion of the town and I was, I questioned it to begin with because it covered areas that aren't even appropriate for development um, that are, you know, outlying areas with their, their hilly and rocky and um, their zoned RO and RLD, so residential outlying and, res and residential low density. So they're, you know, I, I, I always had trouble figuring out how this thing was gonna work. It was basically the whole part of Amherst that's north of the university that was included in this zone. And as I said, it was a federal program that was set up in the last few years to, I think it was to jumpstart the economy, but it, it kind of didn't work for Amherst. I know it worked for other places. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Tom. Um, Janet? So um, I, I, I'm assuming, or I, I think to answer, or I, I'm, a, I, I'm assuming this is kind of, or I, I don't know what the process is here in terms of going through all this amazingly long Excel sheet. And I'm not sure if that's what we're planning to do over the next few weeks. I was hoping, or thinking that we were moving towards MOPIC, the Master Plan Implementation Com Committee, um, which, you know, so the idea is, you know, this is a great start on this work. And then we could pass this along to MOPIC for, you know, starting like implementation and looking at it. Cause like, 
you know, it seems like most of the areas have, you know, this starts with like do an inventory of your resources in this area, assess them and evaluate them, and then figure out programs and strategies and maybe zoning changes that implement that strategy, you know, you know, the assessment. So, you know, um, and so, and that, you know, that's obviously ongoing work and um, things like that. I don't think, I mean, I don't know if we're going to go through every single one of these things that you did with Doug, because we could do that in our own time. And, you know, I've got a million questions about them, but it, I, I thought we were sort of moving towards starting maybe an implementation committee who starts to say, like, how do we implement this to sort of answer the questions that, you know, Tom and, and Andrew have raised, which is like, what's the next step? And so, you know, like evaluating the built up areas and the basis of character quality and priority, like where do we want to preserve our historic buildings? You know, how do we want to do that? Could we do it through incentives or, you know, things like that? And so um, I don't think that, so I, I wonder, is that where we're heading? <laughs> I guess I'm sort of asking the group because is that, is that what the next step is for this group? Or are we going to continue to, I mean, I'm happy to work through this because it's super interesting to hear what's been done. Yeah, I mean, personally, I feel this is, this is, this is great. And I, I know, what we're doing now is what we've all envisioned for a number of years of, you know, planning board kind of looking at and discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think when you have a committee that's going to break this down, then you're looking at compromising Chris Brestrup's time, who is doing great work with the CRC. And I just, I don't know that we have the capacity to really support, you know, a committee. And I, I feel like this has been good. Uh, I thought that we had been talking about doing MOPEC as like, instead of doing, there was a proposal um, by the planning board that put together the master plan to organize this committee. Wasn't there that proposal that you had showed us? I can't remember if this was in the summer or in, this, in the fall, because I feel like every day of the pandemic is yeah. unviable to me. But, um, and so Chris, you were saying that you thought maybe instead of having a broad MOPEC committee, which is called for in the master plan, that we could do it in-house and you could find some time to sort of sit with us. Is that is that is that a discussion that this board has had or did it precede our new members? I can't quite remember. I don't may I answer that? Yes, Chris. I, I don't remember exactly what the discussion was. I think I did say that I would be available to sit with um, a committee. I, I don't really want to get into a lot of paperwork, but I'm happy to sit with people and discuss things and go through, um, you know, some of these strategies like I went through with Doug and, you know, talk about what we could work on moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are two aspects to the Master Plan Implementation Committee. One is that it was set up by, um, it was supposed to be set up by the select, select board and the select board came up with a charge for it and um, no one was ever appointed to it. And that was partly the fault of no one from the planning board volunteered to be on it. And it was supposed to have one planning board member, but there were also supposed to be a lot of other people on it. So the planning board, I guess, by itself um, could establish a committee of the planning board to do what MOPIC was or MPIC was um, supposed to do, but it's it wouldn't be it wouldn't be peopled by town council unless you ask them to set this up. And I think if you ask them to set it up exactly as it had been written up in the charge, it wouldn't be a committee of the planning board. It would be a committee of a lot of other people with one planning board member. So you know you'd sort of have to decide which route you want to go. You want to have a committee of the planning board looking at this, or do you want to have a larger committee that's um, peopled by, uh, that's, I can't think of the word, <laughs> authorized by the town council. So yeah. anyway, I'm willing I, to sit with a small group of planning board members. I don't want to have to get into a lot of paperwork or, you know, um, writing reports or anything, but I can certainly meet with people if people are interested in this topic. Yeah, I'd like to hear what Doug has to say, and he has his hand up, so. Well, I, I feel like I'm jumping in front of Maria. That's all right. 
you 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 were you had a hand in this, so I just oh, I, well, I, sorry, yeah. Ma Maria. Maria will understand, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'll try not to go on too long. Um, I guess uh, I had a couple of thoughts. One, and I hope I can keep them both in mind. Um, first of all, in response to Andrew and and Tom's sort of saying, where do we go from here? Um, I guess as I was going through this with Chris, my thought was that we were basically uh, updating the scorecard of what have we done in the last 10 years. And when the planning board recommended to town council that we just ask town council to adopt the master plan as it was done 10 years ago, and that we not embark on a new master plan. To me, that means we're affirming the points of, or the objectives of the master plan that you know, are listed in this matrix and, and described in the master plan. We're affirming all of that as goals we continue to have. So I felt like Chris was basically giving me a brain dump of what we've done so far. And these are all, you know, many of them came across in the conversation with Chris as uh, sort of living in her head as objectives to be pursued as she's working day to day with all the different people that she comes in contact with. So uh, I guess it's, it seemed to me that Andrew, the next time we really think about whether this is still a good idea, uh, you know, any particular uh, of, the, of the goals listed here is really when we do our next master plan. And um, in the meantime, you know, like the, the one, the, equal, the uh, e economic opportunity area or the transfer of development rights, you know, it was in the master plan, staff tried it and there was resistance by some or all of the uh, residents. So, you know, it's just not gonna get the focus that, uh, or it's not gonna get prioritized by, by staff at least. And so I feel like that's kind of the steady state we're in until we do another master plan. Now, and, and then in terms of Janet's question about the master plan implementation committee, I guess uh, I, I kind of feel like, uh, I guess basically what Jack was saying that, you know, um, I, I don't know if the town staff have bandwidth to support another committee, but I think there's, I've, I've never been completely clear about whether the implementation committee was, was looked at as the ongoing scorekeeper and maybe an advocate with the other branches of town uh, government and you know, volunteer or, or committees um, just a, just a scorekeeper and an advocate, or whether they had any uh, executive role. Um, and I've assumed they didn't have any executive role. So that essentially what we were doing here was sort of a shorthand, uh, you know, update of the scorekeeping. And then we as a planning board are essentially the advocates to other entities, whether it's committees or staff or CRC or whoever, um, for, for what they ought to prioritize. That's all. Thank you, Doug. Um, Maria, and then I have, I have some thoughts, but I, I would note that we're an hour and a half into our meeting. Um, and, um, you know, we'll never, we'll never finish this discussion, uh, on the, uh, master plan implementation. Um, with that said, uh, Maria, please. Um, actually, thanks, Doug and Chris, for doing this because this is very timely. Um, the next agenda items about the CRC's memo about priorities and what they want to look at and 
three months versus six months to 12 months, um, a lot of these align with um, the things that were in this matrix. And in particular, I kind of circled areas that I saw where the priorities, the CRC sort of noted and where we either did or didn't do things. And so a lot of it was in the housing section that, um, you know, I think that a lot of this could blend together in a way so that as we work with the CRC on helping them figure out uh, how to implement these priorities they've set for us, we can look at this really great, you know, tool now that we have because we can see, oh, we've tried this or we um, haven't tried this or here's a objective that can actually help resolve this particular uh, priority that uh, CRC has brought up. So I think this is really great timing to have had this done and in our back pocket now. And I think, yeah, I agree with Doug where we're the planning board, we're sort of like this um, connection between this matrix and the CRC coming to us with like, um, how do we, uh, what were some of the things? We'll talk about this, I hope tonight, maybe a little bit, but just, you know, uh, unlocking housing, um, working with um, fixing the BL in downtown. There's so many of these things that overlap. So um, I think we should definitely keep this matrix and keep referring to it as we work with the CRC. Um, whether we create another committee right now, um, I had hoped that some people from the community who have all extensive sort of zoning bylaw um, expertise could help out. Uh, maybe there's a way you know, if the zoning subcommittee grows into the MPEC zoning subcommittee, um, some sort of group that also brings in more of the planning board members, we can work with the CRC on their, um, this, I don't know what you call this thing, the, the memo from December 5th, you know, getting that um, moving forward. Um, I think that all of that sort of in tandem we have a lot of great resources now, so I really appreciate all the work on this matrix. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like we need to go through every line item, but I think now that we have this, we can refer to it. And it's really great to have. So, um, so Maria, I mean, uh, uh, what, do, what do you suggest? How, how do we approach, how would you suggest we approach the review. Well, of the, of it would the be great uh, um, if later we get to the CRC memo and we think about how we want to fold in our work as a planning board. Um, some of this is really technical and really getting into like zoning bylaw wording. And so at that point, now that we have our priorities, the zoning subcommittee can jump onto particular items from their memo as well as refer to this matrix of like what's been done or what's been tried. Um, and then I would like to just talk to, yeah, the planning board as far as like who else wants to join the zoning subcommittee. And then Chris, is there a way we can bring some people from the community? Um, I think Rob Crowner would be a great, you know, addition. He has so much experience and historical knowledge. Um, it'd be someone from BID, someone who, um, I don't know if it if it makes sense to bring someone from the plan department as well. I mean, it could be just an ad hoc group that we work through things and then we report back to the planning board. So that way we're not, you know, overloading staff with having to set up Zoom meetings. I and mean, we can just as easily set up our own Zoom meetings if that's if that's legal. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I feel like as we get into the CRC memo, we can then think about what the zoning subcommittee could jump on next and whether that can tie into, um, you know, always referring to this matrix as well as bringing in more people. That's pretty convoluted, but that's sort of, you know, it's kind of a nebulous path forward, but that's kind of my, my general sense. So, uh, so you, your feeling is like, we, we shouldn't be going light item during our meetings through this. No, uh, I don't know that, I mean, that'll take days. You know, um, yeah. but I think that as we get into sections that the priorities that the CRC has set up for us, we should definitely refer to that section of this matrix and say, okay, let's look at what's been tried and done or hasn't been done. So, um, but okay. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah. I think what so, Chris did with the land use was useful because so, it's really relevant to us. But so, think, okay. So, so maybe the next meeting we will rely on the board to review the entire document 
and, and we'll just take comments versus having Chris present it all and then maybe divert to the uh, the CRC, uh, you know, kind of pinpointing things and, and, and in using points of reference. Uh, does that sound reasonable to, to uh, everybody on the board or, but Jana has her hand up. So um, I remember like Rob Wilbur from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council saying that if you don't have an implementation committee for your master plan, it will never be implemented. And so um, I understand the issues that Maria is raising because there is a, it is really, it's kind of unclear. I mean, we're kind of in a fuzzy state and I wonder, um, I don't know if this should be homework for the, if I could present that or propose it for the planning board to look at the implementation sections of the master plan and not just this um, matrix, but also there's a whole chapter and um, look at that and think like, maybe we can reflect on like, oh, what's the best way to implement this? Or um, I think if it goes ad hoc, it's never gonna be fully implemented. And so I don't think obviously the hundreds of pages won't, but I do think there's some really big issues here that we need to look at, which is, you know, like a more systematic way. And so can, can we just, I don't think it's gonna happen in two weeks, but we look at the implementation sections and kind of figure out like, oh, do we need an implementation committee? Should it be in-house, you know, or whatever? Or is there, look at the, um, maybe Chris can give the select board um, charge because I thought the charge was really good. Um, and then as to Maria, I'd love to talk more about like what happens next with, you know, the CRC stuff because I'm kind of lost on that myself, so. Um, so our next meeting is January, when is it? January 6th. January 6th, okay. Um, so one thing uh, Okay, can Chris, you have one? your hand? Yeah, please yeah, speak. So I just wanted to say this, as far as I'm concerned, this isn't finished. It's a draft and there were several items that I was going to um, consult other people about. And so I feel like it's um, there's more information that needs to be put into this. And I will keep, you know, plugging away at it when I have time and sending you, you know, um, updated versions of this. I think Doug noted those areas where we need more information. Like I think he wrote in red. Chris, yeah, I, I, I generally did write them in red. Uh, there, I noticed there's a couple that are still just in regular black text, but. So we could, um, I could focus on that, you know, spend some time between now and January 6th, um, seeing if I can get answers to some of those questions, but that's, that's all I wanted to offer. Uh, Andrew has his hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jack. I, I, I think Maria. I think it's a, a great idea of being able to use this as a as a way to reference uh, what we've looked at or what we're what we're what's been shared by the CRC. I would sort of restate my point from earlier, and, and I think like the the TDRs especially, like we it didn't work ten years ago, right? Like so, should we say that it doesn't work? You know, I I don't. I mean, given the time horizon for all of this, I don't know if it's really relevant uh, in certain circumstances. Then also, I think, uh, Janet, the point you made or, or restated, like, I guess, is this the only document that we have that demonstrates progress towards the master plan? And, you know, if so, and I guess it's like, you could argue we don't even, like, there's no point of even having this if, if there's no interest in updating it, right? Um, so I just, Throw it out there. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to more conversation on it. The the TDR. I, I'm having a brain cramp. What? Just uh, the so transfer, the transfer of development rights. Okay. It's just the you know the notion of of building density when all of the public comment we've heard lately is about building density in 40R. Like this is another mechanism of doing it. So the fact that that you know 10 years ago people said no. I don't think it's really relevant when we consider where we are today. So, um, anyway, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Johanna? I'm really grateful to Chris and to Doug for putting in the time to give us this snapshot of where we stand on the master plan. Um, 
I do feel like we have a lot of um, kind of pressing and urgent work that is in front of us right now that would touch on a lot of these aspects. And so rather than like going down the rabbit hole of, oh, let's figure out where in the master plan we're falling short or whatever, I'm a little bit inclined to move full steam ahead with the things that are on our agenda, 40R, the zoning bylaw, and then, you know, a year from now, go back and like update this grid and say, all right, where did we make progress? And, um, and not, I don't know, like not spend so much time on the spreadsheet and the analysis of like, where are we going now? Cause I actually think there's a, we have pretty clear direction about where we, like where the big points of action are moving forward. Thank you, Yana. Uh, based on that, and and uh, Chris has her hand up, but I think that we, we, we do uh, need to move on. And and uh, Johanna mentioned 40R. That's one of the topics we have. Uh, uh, Chris? So I wanted to say, I think there's a lot of momentum on the part of the CRC and the town council to move ahead with zoning amendments. And I think that that's where your um, energies would best be spent. Town Council is only going to be in office for another year. And after that, we don't know who the players are going to be. These players have shown an interest in the things that Mandy Jo has put in her memo to the Town Council. Um, and so I think that there's an opportunity here to act on those things. And that's where we should um, put our effort. So that would be my recommendation rather than um, spending more time going back over the implementation matrix and figuring out what we haven't done or what among those things we would like to do. We have a kind of a list in front of us here that CRC has given us that these are the things they want to do. And I know that the planning department has things that we absolutely need to get done, like the flood mapping. So my preference would be to work with those things where there is already an incentive to move forward. And that's what I would recommend. So um, with regard to this, you know, speaking of the implementation of uh, the master plan, I guess uh, I'm seeking, you know, some consensus from the board of how we want to take this on and any, you know, motions uh, with how we treat this moving forward. I think, again, I haven't had time to go through all this, but it looks, it looks completely solid. I think Doug, and obviously Chris <laughs> for for the work put into this. So it's 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 valuable. We we've not had this before. Um any thoughts on the board? Doug. Uh you know, it's not really clear to me that we need a motion, but you know, if you're looking for one, Jack, you know, I'd make a motion that we we uh, just agree to set this, set this aside, use it as a resource over the next year, uh, allow Chris to finish the loose ends that she agreed to uh, pursue, you know, this time around, and then, you know, just put on our calendars for another year or year and a half from now to sit down and update it. So I, I, I agree. I agree, Doug, no vote, but I would just like affirmative, you know, people kind of shake their heads, whatever, maybe on this, because it won't be on our, you know, future agendas as such, other than a reference. Is everybody okay with that? No. Tom, <laughs> Johanna, yes. Janet? No. No, okay. <laughs> uh, Andrew, okay. so. There's, it's not, it's not unanimous. So let's talk about this, you know, more, you know, next meeting and we'll get, you know, some sort of point of, uh, you know, strategy. Yeah, I could, I could send out the sections on implementation and stuff. And um, so we could look at that and, and not just the matrix, but like, how do you implement the master plan? So I feel like I've spent a lot of time on the master plan this year and I wonder if it's all just going to fizzle out. I mean, and then in 10 years, we do a new one that we don't really implement in a cohesive way. That's kind of my fear, but it may be what happens. So. 
Okay. Well, well th this, you know, it, again, it's uh, 820. <clears throat> we have other items that I'd like to move on to. So uh, the next uh, would be the 40R discussion. And um, and I, my, my understanding is uh, that a few of the planning board members were at a kind of a productive meeting uh, within their districts. And I'd love to, to, to hear about that. Um, and be, but before, I don't know, uh, Chris, if you have anything to say on this, on the, on the, as we're entering this 40 R discussion. My uh, comment would be that I'm interested to hear that there has been support for the 40 R. I haven't really, you know, prior to September say, I wasn't really hearing support for the 40 R from any quarter of town um, other with the possible exception of John Hornick and Rob Crowner. And now I'm hearing a lot of support. And in fact, we received, um, and I'm remiss for not having forwarded them to you, but we received four emails in the planning department email in the last week in support of 40R. So it seems like it's got some energy behind it. And my, um, my feeling is that it's not a finished document. It's it needs some work and um, questions have been brought up by CRC members, particularly Evan Ross and Mandy Johanneke about um, inconsistencies and things that, that we want to change. So I think it's probably a good idea to spend some time on it, for me to spend some time on it, trying to clean it up and for you all to spend some time on it, telling me what you think should be changed in it. And maybe we, maybe we do have a proposal that actually can work. I must admit that I, I wasn't really taking this all that seriously until probably September, October, just because I wasn't hearing support from the community or from really members of the planning board. And now I'm hearing that. And so it's worth, you know, putting some effort into it to make it right and really come up with a good product if that's what you um, would like to move forward with. Good. Um, Doug? Yeah, I guess I wanted to ask, uh, what is it that Jack, you or Chris or CRC want from us about this? Do they want us to try to wordsmith it or to fill in the blanks that are yet to be clarified or are they simply looking for a general uh, expression of support that it's worth others spending time on? So I'm, I'm a little clear, you know, this, I agree, this doesn't feel like a finished document. I have, you know, a variety of concerns uh, from, you know, wordsmithing to overall approach. So I'd like some guidance on, you know, what's the end end point you want to reach with this group? Very good, very good question uh, or, or statement, Doug. And um, Chris, can you provide us some light on? Well, I think that. that the CRC is interested in this. They're they're interested to to the point of talking about it and discussing it. And Mandy Jo has reached out to the other CRC members to get them to send in comments. So far, only Evan and Mandy Jo have provided written comments, but that indicates to me that they take it seriously and they want to look at it. And I don't really feel like it's the CRC's baby. It's, if anybody, I mean, it, in my mind, it probably could have been the housing trust's baby, but they, didn't really want that baby. They wanted to give it to the planning board. So I think it's the planning board and the planning department. It's our responsibility to make this into something that we think is a good product if, if we think that we want to pursue it. And I'm hearing from several members of the planning board that it might be a good idea to pursue this. So um, if the planning board tells me 
that they want us to work on this, we will work on it. Yeah, my personal opinion, uh, since since Doug asked, uh, I, I really, I feel like this is something that is uh, timely given everything that the, you know, the town and the region, the state is, is facing right now. Um, it's a shot in the arm. And I'm very, very interested in implementation, not particularly for the entire scope, but for a portion um, you know, particularly, you know, the BL district there on, uh, uh, you know, west of, of uh, Pleasant Street. Uh, and and there, I just, it doesn't seem like there's any downside. I mean, it, it can be implemented and, it, and it's an overlay. The, the, the developers, the developers uh, can choose to use the, the 40R or not, or use the, the BL. But I just, I feel like our downtown could really use a, a shot in the arm. And I think the the um, the bylaw, the guts of it are, are, are really improved from what we saw in the spring. And um, it's just very intriguing. And so, you know, we're not, I think we're only recommending to, to the town council, uh, whether we would, you know, promote this in total or in parts, but I, but I, you know, if we were to wordsmith, yeah, I mean, that's, the, there, there's a lot there, a lot, a lot of uh, heavy lifting, but um, my two cents, uh, Janet. So I've been, I've listened to the last two CRC meetings and they haven't said, let's go with the 40R. There has been no vote and it doesn't seem like they've even discussed it recently. And so if we're, if we decide, if our goal is to implement or try to run with um, the CRC priorities, I don't see that on the list. Um, and then, you know, I guess when we get to the new business, there's eight to 10 pretty heavy hitting zoning changes. And so, um, so I'm wondering, like, you know, if we, if the planning department, I know you have, the planning department has completely different priorities and things you're working on, these eight to 10 kind of heavy hitting changes that all re often relate with each other, plus working on a 40R. I mean, it sounds like, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't see the CRC saying go for the 40R. And so I'm wondering, I don't think it's possible to do all those things in a year. The second thing is, I think if like by the time if we really spent some deep time on the 40R, we might as well just fix the problems downtown. Like if we're gonna work on the design standards in the 40R, which I think are very weak and we make them stronger, why not make that into sort of design standards for downtown? And so to me, I think our efforts would be if we're gonna focus efforts is to do focus on the downtown pr problems that we see and look at them as a whole. Um, which I think was part of our priorities that we had listed in the summer and doves tails with the CRC changes. But the 40R is like a big, it's a big beast. And just, I don't know who's going to spend the time on it. And I don't think, I don't think the planning department does. If you're going to be doing your flood maps, you're doing a recodification of the bylaw. And I, I keep on forgetting the third thing. Um, is it there's some other big project that you're doing. And then we have like these, you know, very big, Eight, eight to 10 changes proposed by the CRC in the next year, plus the 40R. And, you know, and then in my argument against the 40R, it doesn't address the holistically the problems in downtown. So I don't know, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't wanna spend a lot of time rewriting the 40R, you know, it's 25 pages and it's, it's you know, it's a rough go. So I, I would mention Janet that uh, we do have a couple of pages from the two CRC members within our packet there. So I, I, I think they have um, two of the five members, but- But they haven't voted I, on it and they haven't talked about no, it. No, no, but, but there is, I think there's interest in it. Um, yeah, so I'll let- Yeah, I just don't know. I don't get direction. I don't see the direction from them yet, so. Yep. Okay. Uh, Johanna. Um, it's helpful to hear that other town bodies are thinking, you know, 40R is now like it would be the planning 
board and the planning department that folks are looking to to refine it. Um, I, I think my gut would be to invest the time and refine it and you know, try to put forward a product that we think jives with the master plan and jives with, you know, kind of the direction that, you know, we think based on kind of our experience, the town wants to go in and, and move the ball forward on 4DR. So that would be my inclination. Thank you. Uh, Maria? Um, so, uh, I really appreciate those public comments at the beginning because, um, they kind of said exactly what was going on in my mind and my responses now, which is, you know, when John Hornet came and talked to us about how time is of the essence, if we don't accept this 40 r now, it's going to be five, 10 years before the next fix comes. And this is by no means a fix that fixes everything. This is one of the many tools we need to do a lot of good work. Um, yes, this, this 40 r there are a lot of flaws, but I feel like no matter what state it's in, everyone's going to always see something they don't like. This product has been worked on for a couple years now with um, a lot of consultants who've done this for their profession for many decades a lot of input from public comments, public meetings. I think it's a missed opportunity to not put more time into this. Um, I don't know that we need to invest hours and hours and weeks and weeks. I, I'm almost ready just to accept it as is. I'm just, I so don't want this to go away and be a missed opportunity. Um, it, it can address so many of the issues we have. It's not gonna fix everything, but unlocks BL. We still have to work on the BL of course, but it just seems like if we give this up now, it, it's like, what was all that for? And we're missing out on a lot of what it can offer our town now. Um, it's just such a timely thing. And also I, I think that um, to say, let's just fix downtown. <laughs> We've been trying to do that for decades. I don't think that's an easy thing to do. I think this is one of the tools to you know kind of slowly move toward that, but sort of ignoring this and saying, why don't we just fix downtown? I, I, I don't know what that means. Um, and I think that um, a lot of people I really respect have spoken up and finally spoken up. I think that was because of a lot of concerted effort of um, some people sending out emails and just saying, we need your voices. We need your, you know, there's a sort of a, a silent majority, I think that has always been there, but just isn't, you know, they, they are, they're all working there. They just don't have time to come to these kinds of meetings or send out emails. And finally they are, and it's just so appreciated because um, like Chris said, we just weren't hearing support. And so we kind of thought, well, it's not gonna go, but um, I've always supported it. I just, yeah, I, I feel like uh, if we can put, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to put more effort into it. I don't know how uh, we work with the CRC or the planning staff, but Whatever we can do to make this happen in some form, I think this is the time to do it. That's my, my two cents. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, and I agree with, with what you've said. Uh, Tom? Thanks, Jack. Um, and I, I would probably lean towards agreeing with uh, Johanna and, and Maria at this point. I think it is an imperfect document, but it's getting laid upon a very imperfect uh, overlay area. And I, I think in some ways, um, speaking to what Janet was talking about, if we are going to be making changes to the overlay document, we can explore how those kinds of changes that we want to see are the kinds of changes we want to change in the BL and other parts of the downtown and that we can rewrite those and use this as a learning document to sort of what do we want to craft uh, how do we want to craft the landscape of our downtown and what do we want to incentivize and then we can use that as a means to then shape um, other aspects of um, of the downtown zoning for our benefit so I, I see it as a a way to get this group to spend more focused time on trying to address some of those challenges with downtown zoning, um, but also to capitalize on a, an opportunity that's presented in front of us now to um, 
make some changes that I do think will be beneficial. Thank you, Tom. Um, Janet, you have your hand up, but uh, also Chris. So uh, Chris hasn't spoken in a while, so I'm. I'd, well, I just wanted to like say to I thought it was very helpful to get those comments, really specific comments from Mandy Johanneke and um, Evan Ross. They were questions and comments, and um, if planning board members would be so inclined, I would appreciate hearing from planning board members in the same way. And Janet did. Um, produce a document that commented on 40R back a while ago. Um, and if she wanted to um, update that document, you know, in light of the 40R proposal that we have today, I would welcome that. So any comments that the planning board would like to um, submit, not to all of you at the same time, but just to me, um, you know, to get my thought process going about this would be helpful. And then we could see where we can go with this. Because I think it has potential, but I certainly don't think it's ready to be presented to town council today. I think there are too many unanswered questions. So anyway. Chris, would it be helpful if the board kind of gives a um, kind of an, an approval of the concept for the CRC, or, or, or the, can they wait for you know more specific um, you know comments and and you know again I, how I think Doug brought this up you know how 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 deep are going to drill into to this uh, proposal and. You know, where, where they look, and I, I know we can only recommend it's it's up to the town council on this. I but. think they're, I think the CRC is looking for a product. I'm not even sure they're looking for a product because, as Janet says, said they haven't voted to say we think this is a great idea and we want to see um, a finished product. I think they um, would probably, if if they were inclined to. Uh, support this idea, they would look to the planning board and the planning department to come up with the product and present it to them. I don't think they're going to spend the time doing that. So if the planning board is seriously interested in this and wants to submit comments to me, I will do my best to work on it and try to come up with a product. It's not going to be immediate because I have um, a request from the CRC to work on these three month priorities. So I'm gonna be working on those. I'm also gonna be working on the flood maps and other things. So it'll, it'll take a while, it's not gonna be immediate. But if you're serious about this, it would be nice to try to get it done within the next year so that this, so that this town council could vote on it. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for action, you know, items so like what, what, what do we need uh, to do? And, and is this gonna remain on our, our agenda? Should we have a vote with regard to, you know, are we behind this? I think you are should have a vote with regard to whether you're behind this and then that will give me a direction to move in. And then okay. I'll look to you for specifics. Okay, Janet? So um, the, the thing that CRC also is recommending to the town council, I'm not sure, it's a, is to um, hire a consultant to work on design standards for downtown. I would love to work on that project. I'd love to work with the consultant. I'd love to work with um, the community about, you know, I think there's a lot of agreement on what we want to see downtown. Um, I think people would get on board for more density if they felt like they, they liked how it looked. And it protected the historic buildings, and you know, was a you know a very. Um, we always talk about vibrant, but we also want to talk about like walkable and you know human scale. And so I'm happy to work on that. And so I think that that recommendation. I'm not sure if CRC is going to make that recommendation to the town council and they authorize it or you know whatever. Um, I also think I'm a little concerned about. You know, normally we don't take citizens comments, like do we take general public comments at the beginning of a meeting on issues that aren't on our agenda, just ask people, and then we have public comment. 
what well, after or during our discussion. So I know people are in the audience going to talk, but if we were going to do like a head count on the comments on about you know 40R, it's been overwhelmingly against it. Um, a lot of the people who spoke in favor today live in South Amherst, which you know as we know is a bucolic and beautiful place. The people most affected by it in downtown have been against it, and other people in different parts of Amherst. And so if it's gonna be like a polling thing and we're gonna go with the group that has the most votes, I think we'd say, no, we don't have public support. If four people speak at the beginning of the meeting, that could be a groundswell of support of the silent majority, but the majority majority, you know, 30 people or so have spoken against it or raised concerns. And so those are my thoughts. And I really do think we should go to the public comment and hear more from people you know, like to take that before we make a decision. I think we should also wait to see if CRC is interested because if they're really not, you know, there's so many dogs we have in our race. I don't know, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I, you know, I'd love to work with a consultant on design standards. I'd love to work with somebody for, a, you know, inclusionary zoning. I don't think that's a hard, you know, I think that takes care, there's a huge problem, but I don't really want to go down to the rabbit hole of 40R, which I think needs a lot of work. You know, but if people want to do that, I guess they, I won't stand in the way, but I do think we should hear from the public. And if we're counting heads, most of the people were against it. Thank you, Janet. Um, I would just say like 30 people. We have a population of what, 20,000. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if we talk about silent majority, we, it's all up to town council. I, I, we need to rely on our individual opinions on this and not like who we think we represent. I mean, I don't think that's our charge. Um, well, so I, I do think that we have the people most affected by this proposal have asked to work with us on it and have opposed the height what, density. I mean, they've, you've heard that meeting after meeting yeah. and we're sitting in the audience now. But, and so I don't know. It's everybody's downtown. It's everybody's downtown. And uh, uh, Doug. Um, so I've heard uh, several people express support sort of unequivocally for the entire proposal. Uh, Jack, I think I've heard you say it was uh, a way to unlock the BL. I happen to, uh, and you know, I've said this before, but I, I think uh, it's the areas of the BL where I think I could find, I could most support this. Um, I don't think, I'm not as convinced that our downtown or, or BG area really needs this. Um, so I, my support for this is strongest in, you know, whether you call it the BL or you call it, I think it was zone, zone two that they had in green on that plan. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's one, one point I wanted to make. Um, and with perhaps, uh, well, anyway, so in addition, um, you know, I'd be willing to spend some time with, you know, a couple of other people. Uh, you know, I'd go through it and, and generate a draft and work with somebody, a couple of people, and we could try to try to turn it into something that the board could endorse or, or not. Um, I don't want to spend that time if it's going to be dead on arrival. Um, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, for better or worse, I'm, I'm offering to spend some time on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maria? I'm happy to help you, Doug. And Tom? Same, happy to help out. OK. Like so, I don't know whether the best way is to do it individually with comments like Chris suggested or whether it actually makes sense to get together or yeah. Well, I was, I guess I, I was making my offer to maybe allow Chris not to deal with it at least as soon.
Can we can we hear can we hear from the public people who are have their hands raised? Uh, is any other comments from the board? This time, okay. So we'll open up to public. Uh, you ready, Jack? Yes, Jennifer. Let's start with Jennifer Tom. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I was muted. My name is Jennifer Taub. I live on Lincoln Avenue. And I have to tell you, it is very distressing. I actually saw some of you kind of make faces. You were surprised to hear that there were many residents who have many concerns about 40R and the push for maximum densification in the BL and to relax design standards at the same time. And yes, it's everybody's downtown, but for the many, many residents who live right on Cottage Street, uh, the North Prospect, Lincoln, Sunset, Amity, there's many of us that walk downtown many times every day. It's everyone's downtown, but there are people that use it more than others. And it is concerning that there's, I feel like it's this sort of closed loop. There's five people on the CRC. There's, what is there, six or seven people on the planning board. I don't know if any of the planning board members, it's not geographically represented on the planning board. And I think that there's members of the CRC, I'm just gonna be really frank here, that have some extreme views on what they want to see downtown in the BL and even the, um, the you know, G RG neighborhoods look like. And um, there are, we have an organization that's just forming. We have an active mailing list of over, over 63 residents from Cottage Street and the North Prospect Lincoln Sunset neighborhood. We've weighed in at the, you know, few meetings that were had that we were invited to with the consultants. And I, I feel like we're really not being heard and we want a vibrant downtown, but we want to have, you know, input into what, you know, if 40R is going to be adopted, what it's going to look like, if it's going to be downtown as opposed to some of the neighborhood centers, but nobody moved to Amherst, just like all of you who live in more bucolic areas in town, I don't think anybody said, I wanna to move to Amherst, Massachusetts because I wanna live in a densely populated community with lots of tall buildings that frankly look, we didn't wanna to move to a downtown that looks like One East Pleasant and Kendrick Place. If we wanted extreme density, this is not where we would be. And I feel like we're, we're just not being heard. And we want, we want input into you know, how this is going to unfold. And we feel like um, you know, that we've come to neighborhood meetings and then you know, when I see the reaction here of you're surprised that people hey, are- Jennifer, I, I, I see like there's four more hands. Okay. I, I think you've, you've, you've spoken and I think we understand your, your, your concerns and I apologize, but we're way no, over- I'm happy to, but I just, um, yeah, okay. So, but I, I just think that you, you know, I just want to know that we've been heard and you understand that there's a, there's many people out here that um, don't want to see extreme densification and the relaxation of any kind of design review. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Next is Jean. Okay. Jean Hardy. So, uh, the th uh, Gene, if you can keep your comments to three minutes, that'd be that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much for recognizing me and letting me have the chance to talk. Uh, I have brought this up before and written letters to the newspaper, et cetera, asking that people attending these meetings get to have their their faces seen and they can see the other people here, and that hasn't happened. And I would really like to encourage the planning board to work on doing that because it, it isn't fun to be a faceless person um, operating without knowing who else is at the meeting. Um, that being said, I would like to really thank Janet because Janet is a voice that um, really resonates with the way I feel. I also feel a lot how Jennifer, uh, how Jennifer feels. 
there are 30 people like so jennifer mentioned 63 people there are 30 of us that have spent a lot of nights listening to you talk about 40r and we put in the time to come to these meetings specifically because we care very much about it so jack you say it's everybody's downtown but it's not everybody who is going to have a five-story building right next to them within 10 feet of their house with people looking down into their bathroom if you, you know, many of you live out in the woods and I, I find it strange to have people who didn't choose to live downtown legislate to those of us who do live downtown how we should live. We should want to have large buildings next to us. We should want to not be able to park our cars and take the bus. I've heard all of these things talking about this increased densification, what we should do I see people on the planning board not making those decisions because I, I know where some people in the planning board live. And I, I feel like the people who have the most vested interest are those who live right next to the BL and our way of life, our, you know, my ability to take a shower without having four stories worth of people looking in my bathroom will be directly impacted. So I would really ask that you take these people into consideration. I disagree entirely that there's a silent majority who has very strong feelings about this, who just hasn't been heard. They're silent because they don't really care. But those of us who spend our nights coming to these planning board meetings care because it will really impact us. And I, I really thank Janet for trying to think about, um, about, about us. I would like to also address this unlocking the BL. I don't understand why we need the BL to be unlocked. There are plenty of other places that can be developed without unlocking the BL or without changing the zoning of the BL. And I don't see, I don't see why the 40R is such a fantastic opportunity and why it's only a fantastic opportunity right here in downtown Amherst and not in many of the other, you know, at the beginning of the summer, this committee was saying that we should put 40R somewhere else. So I thought, great. And then suddenly, six months later, we have a complete reversal where there's only one member of the planning board who isn't strongly in favor of 40R. So, um, so, what's so the I thank you so much. Um, Did, was that three minutes? It was. <laughs> um, I can't get my timer to go off here. Could I at least um, finish by saying that the BL is a transitional zone and the way that the 40R is being planned is not a transitional zone. And so it really negatively impacts the people living adjacent. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I would, I would just say that there, the, the, at least for the area that I was interested in, the BL, that, that actually I, I, maybe someone on the planning board can correct me, but it was actually a lower you know, number of stories than uh, that would be allowed. But again, the setbacks and all that make the, the BL unworkable. But the, the proposal by the consultants definitely took into consideration um, the height of buildings, and I and I believe it was only three stories. The second uh, round suggested three stories, but someone else who knows correct yeah, me. Well, that's what we're that's stories. what we're considering right now. We're, that that's that's what it is right now is a, is the second round. So we're we've moved on. Uh, so uh, just wanted to add that. But we have other three more. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, Next is Susanna. Hi, Susanna. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm Thank you. Su I'm Susanna Mossbrad. I live at 38 North Prospect Street. I have uh, sent comments in to Christine that I believe she said she was going to distribute to you all. My concern is that as I read the draft bylaw, it is eliminating a lot of the kinds of review, the design review and the uh, historic review that protect the historic buildings downtown, many of which are in the um, subsection two of the proposed district. And 
I'm very concerned. I think those small buildings give the downtown the texture and the small town feel that the plan that the master plan uh, enjoins us to protect and that are very important to many people's view of why they like downtown Amherst. Um, I'm also concerned that small shops are being driven out by these big buildings. And um, we, we need those small shops because they give uh, people a lot of reasons to come downtown. So those are my concerns. I haven't found a very good forum in which to ask some questions and clarifications of what the intent or what some of the language in the bylaw is. Uh, so I think there needs to be more discussion that uh, citizens can take part in. The consultants mainly talk to people who were not residents, but who were had business interests and uh, not the small businesses, the big businesses. Thank you. Thank you for the time to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Elizabeth. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you're muted. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, this is Elizabeth Vierling and I'm at 36 Cottage Street. And I wanted to start just by saying that I'm in strong support of a vibrant downtown as well as infill and affordable housing. So I just wanted to preface any of my other comments with that comment. I have also written to the planning board in the past and been at these meetings. I do wanna start by saying that in contrast to the speak, the, those individuals who spoke at the beginning of the meeting, I disagree that the consultants and that there was a wide discussion of this proposal um, among residents. As was just pointed out by the previous speaker, the consultants did not speak to a single resident in formulating their proposal. Um, I also would like to agree that the BL zone and design standards as written in this proposal remain non-transitional. They are not transitional. Um, and in fact, the only changes that were made were made because of major pushback by residents and they're still insufficient in my um, estimation. Um, I would also like to point out that it's unclear to me and I have still not gotten an answer from the planning board or from someone familiar with 40R, my understanding is that the 40R overlay does nothing to the general business district because there's no incentive for a developer to use the 40R standards rather than the standards that are already in place, rather than the zoning uh, bylaws that are already in place for the general business district. So we're really only talking about BL as being impacted by 40R and we shouldn't pretend that it's gonna change the general business district. Um, and then just two other points. One I wanna, point I wanna make is that One East Pleasant and Kendrick Place um, do nothing for residents of outside of those buildings, if they even do anything for residents in those buildings. But there's no incentive for anyone to go downtown to see One East Pleasant or Kendrick Place. So if the idea is we're gonna have more of those buildings, we're gonna eliminate any reason to go downtown. And then my final point is that I actually find it extremely amusing to see the detailed plans for a playground when, and, and all the discussion about exactly what the sign is gonna look like on a playground. And then we have no kinds of similar drawings considerations or great detail on what 40R would look like in Amherst. And that I think is, is ridiculous, frankly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I, had, I, I had some thoughts on, on what you had said, but um, they, they uh, escaped me right now. Um, but I, I, I have to say that like Kendrick Place, I have a neighbor that moved into the area because of the jobs that pr were provided by Mass Mutual there. Um, and, and 
you know, so a lot of people and not students live in the buildings there. So I just, I, um, I would temper um, your comments uh, on those two buildings. Um, and do we, um, Doug, there, are, do there we? are two more public comments with two more hands raised. Um, so we have Anastasia would be next. Okay. Hi, Anastasia. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak up about this issue. Um, I've been, I found the comment uh, from the board very interesting. I actually missed the first public comment uh, section at the beginning of the meeting and uh, have uh, found this conversation very interesting and also some of the comments that I've heard made from residents. Um, I think that input is extremely important. Um, and I agree that, you know, I think residents throughout Amherst need to be able to speak up on issues that affect all of them. The downtown absolutely 100% affects every single person in this town, not just people who are living immediately in the downtown area. Uh, but I also wanna stress that, you know, this community is made up of people of all kinds of backgrounds, um, including those who cannot afford single family homes, who cannot afford the high priced real estate in Amherst. And they also deserve to live here and not outside of the boundaries of this town. So if we can provide them an opportunity to do that through you know, zoning that has been adopted already by other communities throughout the state, progressive communities, and we wanna count ourselves as being progressive, that it's important that we consider this um, and, and give it the seriousness that it deserves. And I also want to state that, you know, what brings people to Amherst, I think people appreciate the uh, bucolic and, you know, beautiful scenery in the area. They also appreciate the jobs at UMass, at the universities. Um, these are the things that are driving people to a place like Amherst. They also appreciate the schools that are here. Um, those are the things that are driving them to Amherst. So it's not the, the you know, very expensive housing in downtown Amherst. Um, it is all of the different resources. And if they can't live here and yet they have to work here and they can't send their, their children to school here, um, we actually don't have a very vibrant community. So I do hope that the planning board and the rest of the, you know, the folks who have been involved in this conversation are thinking about all of the neighbors that we have here uh, and not just those of privilege. I appreciate that. Thank you. And we have the last hand raised is Pam Rooney. Okay. Hi, Pam. Hello again. How are you? Good. Thank um, you. I'm. I'm actually quite sad that we that we don't have a vision for our town center. And we, we obviously have some conflicting views on um, what the look and feel of a town center is. I was actually gonna speak uh, about some of the zoning priorities that you were gonna talk about. Maybe you won't get to those tonight, I don't know. But it certainly occurs to me that um, given the lack of vision for the town center, yet we are plowing ahead with a 40-hour proposal that has fairly loose and, and undeveloped design standards. And we're plowing ahead with the dozen miscellaneous CRC zoning priorities. And I think I would, what bothers me is that, is that treating them as piecemeal targets doesn't make a whole. It does not, it does not mean that we come out the other end with something that's cohesive or applicable. So I would, I would challenge you, the planning board, you've said you're the best planning board in years. I would challenge. Oh, oh. Yeah, I can't that, hear you. That, that might've been my, I'm sorry. Uh, that might have been me. I was, I was, <laughs> I Thank apologize, you, Pam. Oh, 
how much of my speech do I need? No, yeah, no, I, 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 I am so I, sorry. I, <laughs> well, you, you, you missed the best part, and that right. that, that I'm that I'm challenging this best planning board ever. Uh, your words exactly um, to take on the responsibility of of doing the legwork, doing the homework on what each what what forty R will look like if you decide to tackle it. What will it look like? How will it feel? Are you actually creating community by the creation of a very dense BL district? I want to. I want you to tell me that because you will be affecting the 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 sense of the town for the next hundred years. Also, as you as you decide to tackle the zoning, I want to see from this group. What are the ramifications of each of those footnote changes? And I think I think there are some very clear ramifications. And I would like to see you do your homework on what they are and how that actually affects um, living in Amherst. Uh, I'm happy to help. By the way, you mentioned Rob Crowner, but there are in fact other people that have been on the planning board in the past who are available. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. So I think we can go back uh, to the board and Janet, you have your hand up. So um, I think Pam has spoken, Rini has spoken to this before. And I think that if um, members of the planning board want to work on the 40R, um, which we all can agree affects certain parts of the BL, I think it'd be good to do a comparison of the 40R, however you draft it, to adding, you know, the CRC change of adding BL to footnote B and all the other footnotes that attach to the BL and give waivers to an idea of changing the BL to business village center, which gives a lot of flexible zoning, but still, you know, keeps heights and things. And to start just looking at three or four options side by side, and what do they look at? What does build that look like? Look like? What are the pro, pros and cons of each? And I think that's something that the planning department and the planning board could work on, and it would be really helpful to the discussion because, you know, we're talking about the 40R in certain parts of the BL, um, in in downtown. Um, CRC is talking about changing BL, which is you know in three different parts of Amherst and with no real sense of what that's going to look like physically. And so I think that's something that we can bring to the table and to the discussion and make it richer. And I, I look um, deeply to Chris Brestrip with leadership and maybe, I don't know if Ben could help with that in terms of drafting, you know, what does build out look like throughout the BL downtown or on Route 9 or on University Drive. And the density numbers should be get really, could get really big especially since apartments are now smaller. And you know that memo that you did in 2016, I think is gonna be helpful, but I think we need to update it because the apartments are smaller. So I think we can, as the planning board, bring some depth to the, to the analysis of saying, let's compare these three different methods for four or five, and what does it look like and what's the best one? And, and also bring the community in to discuss it because you know they have good ideas and it's their town too. Thank you, Janet. So I guess in this, for the sake of time, we're going to have to put this back on the agenda for the, you know, next meeting. I think would be the the wisest thing. Uh, but you'll see when we go over zoning priorities and the comprehensive housing policy that you know, I feel that the town has a little bit of a crisis with regard to the whole housing uh, issue and 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 young families and that sort of thing. And that's only you know that's one of the main reasons I'm. I, I'd like to for us to consider 40R because that's what it's all about. Um, but let's continue this discussion. Um, and you know, Chris, you put it on the agenda for the next for the next meeting. We'll we'll, we'll continue. But it is getting late, and we need uh, we want to talk about Amherst Hills uh, subdivision update, which I think is good news. Uh, Chris. 
Um, yeah, so um, we have gotten word from um, the developer and his lawyer that um, the roadway is essentially finished. Uh, the work that was gonna go on on the roadway to patch the holes and, and repave it. Um, and I've gotten confirmation of that from the town engineer that the roadway is pretty much finished. Um, there are things associated with the roadway that remain undone. And I think those probably have to do with um, some of the drainage um, inf infrastructure. Uh, but I don't know for sure. So I've reached out to the town engineer to get a sense of um, what exactly, in addition to the roadway surfacing, needs to be done and how much does he think it's worth um, in terms of you know, a cost estimate. Um, we did get a, a request from Michael Pill, who represents Tofino Associates, um, to, for the planning board to consider um, rescinding that notice that they have filed with the Registry of Deeds. The notice um, requests that the building commissioner not issue building permits for, I think, six or seven lots in the Amherst Hills subdivision pending uh, finishing the roadway work. So um, I need to talk to the building commissioner about that. And I need to talk to the town engineer about um, exactly what work does remain to be done and um, then I'll come back to you with a recommendation about what to do about that notice that you that you've put in the registry um, to request that the building commissioner not issue building permits. It's possible that you could move forward with re releasing some lots from that um, that notice. So that that would be upon the request of the owner slash developer. Yes, and we've received an email. Uh, with that request. I don't okay. know if I forwarded right. that to you. Right. I don't think I did ref uh, forward it to you. I didn't think it was um, ripe for you to act on, but okay. possibly by January 6th, that would be ripe because I will have heard from uh, the town engineer about how much work remains to be done off the roadway surface. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so um, topics not reasonably anticipated, 48 hours part of the meeting for old business. I have a topic that I could report on, which is that it appears that the Amherst Media Site Plan Review and Special Permit was not appealed. The deadline for the appeal was supposed to have been December 14th. We filed that decision with those decisions with the town clerk. I think we filed them on November 24th. So in any event, as of the close of business on the, on the 14th, there had not been an appeal filed according to the town clerk. So if that holds, then that means that that project can move ahead. Um, so I think that's good news in my mind. Uh, on that note, I, I noticed like within a, might've been the Gazette that the, the Hills, Henry Hills, what? Henry Hills house. Yeah. yeah Henry Hill. Yeah. So they, they, they're, they're putting up a, a barrier there with regard to arborvitae or something like that. That's right. Uh, but that's, they're completely within their right to do that. They are certainly, Fairly. yep. It's in an oh, RD okay. zoning district and they're a single family house so they can do what they want with their single family house. Okay. Yep. Very good. Um, okay, so on the new business, uh, can we just jump uh, from, skip the zoning priorities just because of the comprehensive housing policy, I just want to introduce that. Um, what has been distributed <clears throat> to uh, the planning board. I, I'm not keeping track on that, but um, okay. So we have a, we have a, a couple of pages from the CRC, but I I believe there's there's much more. Uh, just met with the with the CRC. They had the chair of the uh, uh, well, they, they had the CRC uh, committee members. Then I was there and they had chair of the ZBA uh, 
the the CPAC, uh, Sarah Marshall, uh, the the Environmental uh, Commission. There, I forget the name of it. The, the acronym there. Uh, yes, uh, and thinking that that was it. So anyway, they 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 brought on, and so we, the the question is that. Uh, we're going to be looking at this pretty detailed policy for how the town, you know, approaches what I term the, the housing crisis. But um, it, you know, John Hornick has been developing this for many, many years, and uh, and and I think the CRC is pretty much adopting what he's saying, but they're putting their own. Uh, you know, revisions uh, to it. Um, and we have a policy, but now they're, they're working on measurable goals aspect of it. But again, Chris, we haven't distributed uh, any draft to the board. No, we did. Time. We did distribute a draft. I think it was either last year or the year before, but that was the draft that the housing trust had yes. produced. And yeah. then um, now the town council has asked the CRC to come up with a version that the town council can adopt. So the okay. CRC is looking at the, the version that the housing trust produced, but they're um, taking part of it and not taking other parts and they're rewording it to their own, um, you know, to their own liking. So they, they do intend to come up with a housing policy working with John Hornick and the housing trust but a yes. policy that the town council can accept and adopt. So in, in concept, I guess it's, it's a decision that, that we can make as a board. Would we make individual comments on this policy and forward it to the CRC or we would we would rather uh, collectively as a group uh, provide you know, our bullets and, and with regard to comments there. So that was you know, just a, a, or a, a process you know, order of, of, of business there, how might we want to, um, you know, approach this, this topic. So I, that much, I know, I just, I, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that or not. Uh, Doug? Yeah, uh, I guess I'm a little, I thought I received a draft housing policy document that came out of CRC or maybe the town council a couple of months ago. It was like in October. Am I confused that it wasn't this comprehensive housing policy and it was some other document? It might have been the the, the older one that just the housing trusts developed. So I don't, I'm not sure that had the CRC's you know fingerprint on it. Okay, Chris, do. You, I, I don't think the CRC has come up with a, a complete document yet. They're working on it piece yeah. by piece. I think they're going through the housing trust document bit by bit and, and putting their own stamp on it. And um, But if, if Doug thinks he has a document that he received a few months ago, I'd be interested in knowing, um, you know, maybe he could forward it to me and I could figure but, out. What um, yeah, so, so we have nothing here, but I just, you know, it's coming. And I was just interested in how the board felt about you know, being a group and, you know, voting on our comments on this or just doing it individually and, and sending it to the CRC. Um, no. How do, how do folks feel about that? Janet? I, am I, okay. I think it might be useful to read the policy and have us discuss it together. Um, I'm not sure, and then I think it might be more efficient just for us to send our individual comments, unless there's something issue we feel really strongly on. Because I always find those, um, I don't know, that's, I'm kind of 50-50, but I think I'd like to hear what other people think of the policy when we get it. Um, but I don't know if we, you know, we might spend a lot of time saying this bullet, this bullet, when maybe we'll just send 20 small bullets or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tom, or excuse me, Andrew first. Thanks, Jack. Um, and I think I may be confused because when we say we're waiting for something, what is this draft revision eight that we got in our materials? 
the comprehensive housing policy. Yeah, that looks like a, more of a, an, an abstract of it, but there's a longer version, but it, it lacks the implementation goals uh, or excuse me, not, uh, the measurable goals. So there's like the back half of it isn't okay. in the draft. And so one of the comments was like, let's, let's just look at the entire draft versus the front half, which is the policy. Um, but I think, you know, John Ornig has been a proponent of having these measurable goals because you don't, you don't achieve them unless you, you know, you put the goals out there. So it's, you know, let's get this a much, you know, affordable housing out there within a particular, you know, time span and measure that. And we've fallen short uh, of what, you know, the conceptual goals were that have been laid out in the past, but. Um, <clears throat> So we so we are going to be receiving them that the full view shortly or I think that they are they they yeah they understand that they should just release the draft of everything and not just the policy even though yep. they they feel a little bit more confident about the policy part versus the measurable um, you know part okay. of it so and, and and then the question is do we provide comments for the full draft individually or as a group as well. Your recommend, yeah. Yes, and that's why I was just wondering, kind of this, kind of doing a a, a straw poll. For yeah, the board. I, I think. Yeah, I would I would probably agree with Janet. I mean, I think, you know, we need to review it individually, come up with our recommendations, and then you know perhaps we can review our recommendations together. But um, it it's all going to begin with an individual review anyway, um, and uh, I think that there's value in in seeing what everybody thinks. Um, before we, if we decide to come up with like a group consensus. Thank you. Um, Tom? Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I, I agree with um, uh, both Andrew and Janet. I do, I do think we need to have a discussion. Um, my sense is hopefully we can have some key items like benefits, concerns, questions, similar to Mandy Joe that we may all share in common. Um, it may come just naturally out of our conversation, but if it doesn't, then I do think it's probably more efficient for us to write up our own individual summaries with some kind of standardized format the way Mandy Joe and, um, I'm sorry, I forgot who the other person was uh, that came from um, town council. So, so I, I agree we do need to discuss um, and, and hopefully we can come to consensus, but if we can't, then I think we need to issue our own individual statements. Okay, so you know, at this point, it's just a, a heads up that this will be coming to us. And I think it's a very important document for the town. Uh, so you know, I hope we all can give it our, uh, Give it our best in terms of promoting it and then pam i'm, I'm wondering if we uh when we were talking about the amherst hills that we skipped over uh mr uh master alexis um, um well i didn't hear you ask for public comment i did not i did not but i didn't know that there would be any but i i'm sure that's can we go back um, and revisit that in, in if he has something to I'm, say on that? Chris, I think Chris is getting ready to speak. No, I'm not. Sorry. Oh. But I think it would be good to hear from Mr. Master Alexis. Yeah. Um, he's probably going to react to what I said, or maybe he has further information. OK. Hello, Mr. Master Alexis. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, great. And first of all, thank you very much, Chairman Jemzek, uh, for allowing me to speak here tonight. I'll be brief. I know it's been a long meeting here. And uh, first of all, I just want to say I've been sitting here for three hours, and I want to compliment you all on the careful consideration that you've given every issue that's come before the board. It's been really interesting for um, me to watch. So thank you for your service here in doing this, okay? Um, first of all, I wanna say that the road looks great. Our road looks great and I'm very happy about that. So, uh, and I wanna thank you for that, okay? And um, 
the town engineer has been driving around uh, every day that the road's been do doing that. And I, I haven't been watching it, haven't been watching for him, but we're all working from home and I see his little blue truck driving by. And I wanna thank you, thank him for that. But I wanna just say this, um, make no mistake about this, that this work was done in this neighborhood because the planning board put the moratorium on the building permits and the sewer guts. Okay, which if we go through this, which I'm not, was a replacement for the initial um, um, uh, requirements in the subdivision for the work to be done. So I'm very happy that the developer did the work, but I would ask the planning board to not remove the moratoriums on the sewer hookups and building permits until all the work in the subdivision is done. So when all that work is done and the, your requirements, the previous planning board put those requirements in this subdivision, when that work is done, then release those uh, re, um, building permits and suing hookup moratorium. And then the, the subdivision will be complete. And after one winter, which I think is this winter, the road can be offered to the town and the subdivision will be completed. Okay, so that is what I'm asking for your consideration. Keep the hookups and uh, the moratoriums on the sewer hookups and building permits until all the work is done. That's all we're asking because it's been a 15 year subdivision. It's taken until this point for the road to be done and we just want the work to be done. I know there's an, another issue here that's not related to the planning board with regard to a lawsuit. We're very comfortable defending that lawsuit as I represent the neighborhood here, but please do what you need to do that all the work in the subdivision is completed, okay? And that's really, and keep oversight of this project. If you release the lots, there's no incentive and no oversight for the developer to do the work. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Jim. I have a question. Yes. Um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Mr. Master Alexis for um, speaking tonight. I wanted to ask him to call me so that I can have a phone call with him um, and, and talk about um, moving forward. But my question to him tonight is when he refers to completing the subdivision, is he talking about completing the portion of the subdivision that is currently built? Or is he talking about completing the entire subdivision, including the roadways that haven't been built yet? Well, that's, Jim. I, I just want to say, can you hear me, uh, Ms. Yes. Brestrup? Okay, great, thank you. Um, you know, Ms. Brestrup, that's a, a conversation that I'd like to have with you because there is a entire road that is undeveloped with a gate on it. And I don't think that it's necessary for us to complete that, well, not me, but to Fino to complete that work before the moratoriums and sewer hookups are released. But I'd like to know what the developer is planning to do with that road, but I'm happy to call you and discuss this with you because you know, we wanna be reasonable about this and all we really want is our subdivision to be completed. So I hope that answers your question, but I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, should we talk tomorrow? Yes, you can call me tomorrow. All right, great, I'll give you a call, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so moving on to uh, the last item in our new business, uh, which again, it's 9.30. Uh, we had 20 minutes that I proposed for this, but I, I don't even know that I can do 20 minutes uh, at this point. But um, I, I just want to say, you know, congratulations to the CRC and Chris Brestrup for the the detail, you know, that's provided in this memo. It's 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 thorough, and there's just a lot in there, and we and we can see where Chris has been spending her time. Uh, in a beneficial way. So I just wanted to, 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 to say that. Um, but again, we can do one round of comments and obviously this will be back on the agenda uh, 
for the the next meeting. So um, we're talking about the the December fifth, twenty twenty memorandum from the CRC with regard to zoning priorities uh, recommendation. So if uh, folks want to speak to that, now's the time. Janet. So I, I asked you all to put this on the agenda <clears throat> because um, as you know, as you now know, the CRC has recommended like eight to 10 zoning changes, some of them to happen within, you know, three months um, after, I guess, town council, if they approve. Um, and I, a lot of them are interconnected and they also sort of tie into changes in the dimensional table that is riddled with um, footnotes and kind of hard to follow. Um, and so one of the reasons I asked to put it on the agenda, and I, it could be a preliminary discussion of, is this the, like what happens with the planning board next? Like at the CRC meeting, they were saying, you know, we're not going to write this zoning. We look to the planning board and the planning department to work on that. And then we also have that flow chart, that procedures chart that we agreed to last June or May about how the CRC and the planning board will work together when there's some you know, proposals on the table. So I'm wondering like, what's our next step as a board? Are we in that flow chart where we're going back and forth with the CRC, we're doing our analysis. And I just kind of wondered like, what happens now? Um, the other, the other reason I really wanted to bring it to is that I thought the CRC was going to be doing a much deeper analysis of the zoning changes, like their community impact review, um, which they have a very detailed process and policy for how they'll look at impacts on different communities on you know, land and the whole thing. And so like for me, like when we're looking at zoning changes as a planning board or a town or anybody, I think we really need to understand the changes, like what, what the existing zoning is and what the zoning, the change means in terms of the number of lots, the number of units, what does build out look like on a lot? What does build out look like in the area? And there's like no pictures to this. And some of this stuff could get very dense and very big, particularly in outlying areas um, and residential neighborhoods. And I don't feel like I understand what that's gonna look like or what the impact is. And then, um, so I think we need to do that kind of analysis so we know what we're talking about. Um, and then again, looking at options side by side, like I don't have any sense that CRC was comparing one option over the other and saying, oh, here's the problem. Here's some fixes. This is what one will do with the other. And what are the impacts or pro pros and cons of each? So I'd like to see any change that we have, much less eight or 10, have that kind of deeper look. And then also, as I say constantly, and I, I will say constantly, is that um, the town residents need to know what's happening in the town, like in general, because we know we have, you know, what we do in one section impacts others, but people who are directly affected need to know what's being proposed. And so I, I just what I want to see that kind of those three principles applied to these changes. And I'm hoping that we'll take a deeper look and the planning department will take a deeper look so we can kind of offer that. But I'm really wondering, like, where do we go from here? Janet, uh, three principles, what? One is that we need to really understand as a community and a board, the changes, what the existing zoning is and what the changes will be, like in terms of the number of units affected, the number of lots and what a build out would look like on one lot, but over time in an area. Um, I don't have any sense of that analysis or that I have no visual picture and then also we just need to, the number second principle is really to look at options side by side and consider the effects. When I started looking at some of the effects in the residential neighborhoods, it was really concerning to me, um, you know, how one footnote would be the other or, and I could talk about that more specifically, but I don't want to do it now. And then also that the residents of the town need to be involved, like they have to know that these changes are being proposed and be part of that process, particularly if in the neighborhoods where people are most affected. And that hasn't happened at the CRC level. It's a, you know, they, 
like I thought they were going to do that. Like in this summer, they said we want to talk about the priorities amongst ourselves, and they ran that priorities process. And I thought their plan was to take it to the community and get um, get some impact input. And then when I asked them when they're going to do that, it turns out they weren't going to do that. I had asked that question in the summer. I thought it was going to happen because they said so. And then I asked it again recently, and they said they're not going to do that. So. I, that seems like a big missing hole that I'd love to see us kind of fill in a bit. Thank you. Uh, Chris? So um, I think that what is going to happen is that the planning staff will draft some of these things and bring them to the planning board. And with documentation like Janet is asking for, and we did do some of this, um, as Janet said, a number of years ago when some of these things were proposed. So similar to the way we brought um, zoning changes to town meeting um, with backup and analysis, I think we will bring them to the planning board with backup and analysis. And then the planning board can um, decide whether the, the zoning amendment is ready to move forward to town council. So I think there'll be a lot of um, working together of the planning department and the planning board and that town council will be um, interested in learning about these things and perhaps giving their support or making changes, but it's mostly going to be planning department working with planning board to develop these these zoning amendments. That's my that's my um, prediction, I mm -hmm. should say. Mm -hmm. Did did the did the CRC know like about the the impacts how the the BL could change? Did they? Get all those numbers and information that you had because I, I think I think the twenty the memo that you wrote in twenty sixteen I think all those numbers are worse because the units will be so much smaller not worse I guess that's a bad that's a judgment but it's it, it's going to be so much more and so I would like to see I'd like to you know get that I can't run those numbers I'm not that kind of person but did the CRC see that or analyze that in there? No, the CRC didn't see that. This was based on um, lists that the planning board and the planning department have been working on for years about things that need to be worked on. Uh -huh. And so um, the CRC hasn't gone into any, any specific detailed analysis of these things. And they're counting on us to present okay. that information to them. Okay. And if you'd like to forward that e that memo that I wrote in 2016 to me, oh. I would be happy to receive it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, somebody sent it to me. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, without any other comment uh, from the board, we can uh, we can move on. So I see no no hands raised, um, and also from the. The public, I don't see anything. So let's close that. It will be back on the agenda for our next meeting. And uh, topics not reasonably anticipated 40 hours prior to the meeting for new business. Can't think of anything. Okay, great. Um, form uh, ANR subdivision applications. We have two of uh, form ANR applications, and we'd like to present them to you, and Pam can. Um, bring up some uh, pictures. One of them is at the corner of um, Harkness Road and Belchertown Road, and the other one is on East Pleasant Street. And I don't know with, which one Pam is going to bring up first. Whichever, whichever one was in the packet. I think the one that was in the packet was, um, I don't remember actually. I've seen both of them more recently. Just whichever, bring up one of, one of them, if you can. Yep, I'm trying. Bear with me one second. The one that was in the packet was Belchertown and Harkness. One forty two Harkness Road. Here it is. Yep. So Harkness Road is on the bottom of this drawing here. Um, actually, this drawing is much is very useful because Belchertown Road is the road that slashes through from uh, northwest, or actually from the upper left to the lower right. Um, Belchertown Road is Route 9. Harkness Road is the one that goes um, north from there. And the property that is surrounded by yellow 
is the Oops. property that's being uh, proposed Sorry, Chris. to be. Um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why does this happen to me every time? <laughs> You're flying around town, aren't we? <laughs> Hold on. We're going to try it again. It's the late hour. We're, we're going to finish soon, Pam. <laughs> we're going to go the old fashioned way. We're not going to do this. We're going to do it like this. There you go, Chris. Okay, so that's the location. And then can we look at the ANR plan, Pam? Yes. So the ANR plan, in this case, the uh, orientation of the plan is different. Um, and Harkness Road is on the bottom of the page and Belchertown Road goes from, um, goes in a kind of upward direction, um, angled up. So what the, what the landowner is trying to do here is create four lots out of one. And um, you can see the lots demarcated lots one through four. Each one of them has the appropriate amount of lot area. Each one of them has the appropriate amount of um, frontage and they all have the building circle um, superimposed on them. So we would be looking, and the other thing is that they've, they've shown here that um, at least 20,000 square feet of these lots is um, upland area. So this has been reviewed by the town engineer mm -hmm. and um, with, with your permission or authorization, we would ask Jack to sign this on behalf of the planning board. The signature means that um, this is not subject to subdivision control law. In other words, um, there's no roadway being created here a uh, subdivision would be um, a new roadway that's created and then new lots off that roadway. These are frontage lots and they're being created off existing roadways. So does anyone have any questions? Janet has a question. Janet? Um, I can't really see it. There's like a lot of swiggles and I'm not sure. So. Are there any easements or wetlands or I can't, I can't see what I'm really looking at. I feel like I, I need there some are wetlands. Yep. And I think you have this in, in your packet, but maybe you didn't have, you didn't have the ANR plan in your packet. That's right. No. We hadn't yeah. scanned it by then. So um, let's see, let's take lot four over on the right. Lot four has a, um, a line that looks sort of like a necklace and it goes from Harkness road and it follows up towards um, the north, the western property line, and that's the wetland line. Okay. And then there's a 50-foot offset from that, which is essentially where a, a new house could be built. So um, they're showing that um, a new house could be built kind of in the lower uh, left-hand corner of this property here. Um, they're also showing. Let's see if I can get, I have the people in the way. I have people in the way. Okay, so the lot would be 80,000 square feet and the upland area of that lot is 41,000 square feet. So that is more than 20,000 square feet. So that meets the buildable lot area requirement. It meets the, um, the zoning bylaw requirement. I believe that is in the RLD zoning district. And there's a requirement for two, 200, feet of frontage, and that's why this, um, this circle here is 200 feet in diameter. Okay, thank you. The other lots, like um, the one that's uh, noted as lot one, has 271,304 square feet mm -hmm. and um, over four acres of upland. So that qualifies with regard to upland as far as being a buildable lot. Um, it's in the RN zoning district, which requires 120,000 uh, linear feet of frontage. So it re is required to show a building circle of 120 
square feet, which is right here. And they put the, uh, I think there's an existing house on the lot. So they've located the building circle around the existing house. I, I guess I have control here, don't I? Um, this is the wetland line right here. Um, and mm -hmm. this is the 50 foot offset line. I, I cannot see Chris's Oh, you cursor. can't see my cursor. Okay, well, maybe Pam can show the- I'm um, sorry, I was writing notes at the same time. Where are you, Chris? On lot one, can Pam show yep. the um, oh, wetland okay. line? Oh, there's the zoning line. Yes, the RLD and the RN zone. This is the- Oh, wait, this is the wetlands. Nope, the wetland is that little thing that looks like a necklace. It's got like a long line and a oh, little one? short debt. Yeah, that's the wetland line. Um, so things no west of that and north of that are wetland. Then it shows a 50 foot setback line, which is that dashed line that is parallel to the wetland line. And everything okay. um, to, to the east of that is, um, is considered to be upland. Um, so that's lot one. And then there are two other lots here. And we can scroll down a bit. We can look at those. Wait a minute. What do you want to do, Chris? Can you scroll to the south so we can see, or not to the south, to the east, to the bottom of this drawing? <laughs> okay. So, um, and, and let me see the lot numbers, lot uh, three and lot two. So your cursor is right near. Oh, the I see. Okay. This is lot two. Yes. And this one is lot three. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So now scroll up a bit so that I can see what um, the surveyor has written about lot two and lot three. I was to do that. All right. I'm going to have to um... go over on the side and use that little scroll bar. Can you do that? Yep. Yeah. So do yeah. it. Pam, rather, rather than sliding that square, go to the bottom of the right-hand side and click briefly on the arrow at the bottom. Oh, that's right. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Is that so, what you want me to do? Thank you. Yes, that's perfect. So lot, thank three, you. lot three is required to have 20,000 square feet um, total. So it has 35,000 square feet total. And it looks like it has um, 26,000 square feet of upland area and that um, exceeds the 20,000 square feet that's required. The little line there that looks like a necklace is the wetland line. And there's a 50 foot offset for um, the buffer that needs to be respected where a house can't be built. This is and there's a, yep. And there's a circle there that shows the um, building circle, which again, this is in the RN zoning district. So the building circle is 120 feet in diameter. And to the left of this is lot two, which again has wetland in the upper left corner. Yep, Pam is tracking it right now. It has a 50 foot um, buffer zone against the wetland. It has um, the 120 foot building circle. And it is also in the RN zoning district and it's got um, 61,547 square feet which exceeds the 20,000 square feet that's required. And it um, has 42,000 square feet of upland, which exceeds the um, 20,000 square feet that's required. So all of these lots meet the zoning requirements and the town engineer has looked at these for other issues and um, has not made any comments about this. Thank you for that exhaustive it's too bad that it's not like a cluster because it could sort of get off the wetlands better. But anyway, this is not my land. Okay. All right. Is everybody good with this? And we'll authorize Jack to um, sign this. Chris, it's Johanna. I have a quick question, and maybe this is just a teachable moment. But um, I'm. Can you help explain, like the building circle, and what are the impacts in the building circle, and why is it okay for a building circle to overlap with wetlands and buffer zones? So uh, the building circle is described in section 6.3 of the zoning bylaw. It's a requirement of, um, of, a, of a lot that's created. If you wanna be able to build on the lot, then you have to show the building circle. 
and the building that you're going to construct has to be within that circle. Um, it can be anywhere within that circle as long as it meets the setback requirements. Um, in the case of lot four, I do see that the building circle overlaps into the wetland and into the 50 foot um, buffer zone, but there's plenty of room left in the rest of the circle um, for a house to be built. So uh, it doesn't matter that some of that building circle is overlapping into the wetland. Does that- There will be some, like who makes sure that the house doesn't get built in the wetland and that the wetland isn't disturbed during construction and all that. So when um, the developer or the homeowner comes to the building commissioner for um, a building permit, the, uh, the inspectors and the building commissioner will look at this map and they will, um, they will know whether the building is proposed to be built in the proper location. Um, so that's how, they, that's how they know. The building commissioner and his inspectors take care of that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think there'd be a general concurrence. We do, do we need to do a roll call for this? Nope, as long as nobody objects. Okay. I missed my hand. I my hand up. Oh, for sorry, a while. Doug. I'm, I'm so sorry. I saw that a while back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I wanted to ask: Are there any limitations on curb cuts along Har Harkness Road? The uh, parcel that's at the intersection with Belchertown looks like it might be a little close to that intersection for a curb cut into Lot Two. So I think that the town engineer has a policy of not allowing a curb cut within 75 feet of an intersection. So it looks like that um, where the building circle is, is far enough back on the lot that um, it would not be within 75 feet of that intersection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So, so let's move on to the next one. Yes. Yeah, so uh, upcoming ZBA applications. Nope. Um, we need to go through, excuse me, we need to go yeah. through another ANR. That oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. But Chris, uh, did we get like a general consensus to endorse this one? Yes. 202104. Okay. All right. So I will move this on. Hold on. Here's the next one, 610 East Pleasant Street. So the next one is located just north of Eastman Lane and Tilson Farm Road, which is in the vicinity of the North Amherst Fire Station and the UMass Police Station. So um, Pam has outlined um, part of this um, right. lot in yellow. This is an area where there's already an existing house. And what the um, property owner wants to do is combine the two lots, one lot to the north and one lot to the south into um, a bigger lot. So in other words, combining three lots into one. Um, two of these lots are a little bit undersized in terms of their, not in terms of their lot area or frontage, but in terms of the way they're configured. And so I think that neither the lot on the north nor the lot on the south could contain <coughs> the appropriate size building circle. They're sort of trapezoids. So anyway, if Pam will show us the ANR now, that would be helpful. So this is the, um, the ANR map. It's a little bit different from uh, the other one that you saw. It's not <coughs> different surveyors have different ways of drawing these, but in any event, you can see the existing house on the big lot in the middle. And then you can see the, um, the dashed lines that represent the, um, the previous um, lot line. And I think there's a note on them if you can zoom in on this a little bit. Can you do that, Pam? <laughs> do you dare me to try? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> zoom in on this. We may never get back. It's all right, keep going. Wait a minute, I can't, what's going on? Lot line is to be removed. You see that? this right here? Is that what you were trying to read? Yes, lot yes. line to be removed. 
And yep. it says the same down below. So those two lot right lines here. are being removed and the three lots are being combined into one uh, lot that will be 3.12 acres in size. And that's um, more than is necessary for this zoning district. I think this is RN. Do you have the um, application there with you, Pam? I do not, Chris. All right, well, in any event, you can see that the two lots for, to the north and south are appropriately sized for this zoning district, which I believe is RN. So when you put them all together, they're more than uh, big enough. And there's, um, you can imagine that there could be a building circle where that building already exists that would be 120 uh, lin uh, linear feet in diameter um, because each one of the smaller lots has a frontage that's 120 feet. So do you authorize um, Mr. Jemsik to sign this plan? Doug has his hand up. Yep. What yeah, I wondered whether we should anticipate another A&R coming down the pike that splits this new lot into, into two lots. I think you might anticipate that, yep. Thank you. Any other comment? Okay, I guess uh, that you know. Um, We're good to presumptive, go. Presumptive approval here. Um, <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so let's. Uh, the next would be uh, ZBA applica applications. Mm -hmm. Sam's got a handle on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a handle on it. But the ZBA is going to meet next on January seventh. And they will take up um, application FY 202111 for um, um, to request a special permit to modify an already approved special permit um, to, in order to remove a condition, condition number six that requires the single family house to be owner occupied and it's located at 180 Summer Street. So that will be on January 7th and also on January 7th. Um, they hopefully will be reviewing, they hopefully will have received and will be reviewing a special permit application submitted by the town to allow for an oversized sign and now I'm having the same problem Chris had and an offsite sign in residential zoning district, which will be on the corner of 280 Main Street and Triangle Street. So it will actually be on the property um, of the Emily Dickinson Museum. And this is potentially what the, what the sign might look like. There's going to be another part to this sign, which is down below where it says town center, and it will be a sign directing people to the entrance to the Emily Dickinson Museum. So, oh, so another um, one down here. Yes, that's right. So that's going to be reviewed by the zoning board, we believe, on this 7th of January. January. That's so, it. That's it for me. Does Great. the planning board feel um, that they would like to have a presentation about either of these projects? Mr. McDougall has his hand raised. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, maybe a question for Tom. Is this, is this an example of the way, the new wayfinding signage that, that I've been hearing about or? Chris? Yeah, so yeah. Um, that would precede oh, me. Okay, all right. I'll so uh, there, is, there is a system that's being rolled out and this does look like the language that's in some of the documents that I've seen, um, but I haven't seen the whole system deployed in yet. And that's coming back to the board and probably around the same time. So yes, this is part of that wayfinding system. None of the other signs are as big as the one that's going to be installed on the Emily Dickinson site. Um, the reason for that is that Emily Dickinson Museum uh, agreed to have the town sign located on their property in exchange for having the um, Emily Dickinson sign down below. And that's what made their the sign on that property very large. And um, 
And that's the only one that actually needs a land use permit because the other signs are all in the town right of way. And you can get a sense of what these signs look like by um, going by the, the roundabout at the intersection of Triangle Street and East Pleasant Street. Although um, these new signs are gonna be different. The, the brown of the main part of the sign is darker. The band below is um, green rather than a sort of yellowish color. And um, we think that they're better looking, but <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. And I think that was the opinion of the design review board. Great, thanks for the extra info. Mr. Marshall also has his hand raised. Doug? Yeah, I'm just wondering whether the arrow to town center is accurate for this sign. And if so, why it's not telling people to continue on, on Main Street straight ahead. I think that the sign that's going to the ZBA has an angle to it. So it's angling up to the left. Um, it's not going straight to the right so th or left. So this sign is kind of a generic sign, um, part of that system. We don't have a picture of the sign that's going to be presented to the ZBA because we don't have the correct arrow direction and we also don't have the, um, the band down below with the Emily Dickinson Museum sign on it. But if you'd like us to bring you that one back, we'd be happy to do that. I don't need you to. Okay. Great. Um, that's it for the ZBA? Yep. Okay. So we can go on to uh, upcoming uh, SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Um, there are always things out there in the wings, but nothing has come in recently. So, um, you know, we're always talking to people about projects that they have in mind, but nothing has been submitted. Very good. Uh, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We had a regional meeting, but on the 10th of December, um, we're gonna be looking at the, the top 10 resolves for the Pioneer Valley Planning uh, Commission District. Um, and then they, you know, they spoke to the, uh, the direct local uh, technical uh, assistance grant that, that Chris, you know, mentioned earlier, how, you know, they're there to support uh, the municipalities and their jurisdiction. Um, I think some mention of the housing crisis uh, in our area was made by uh, Catherine Roddy. Uh, and, and then little bit about what's going on in Beacon Hill, some envir environmental justice issues, and that's that was about it. So that's all I have. Um, on to the CPAC, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Um, we had uh, wrapped up sort of our five-week sprint of meetings here and proposals. Um, there were 13 that we started with. We ended up approving 12. One of them is or deferred, it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't meet the criteria for CPAC. Um, I think I'd mentioned previously that the state match was, was larger than expected this year, which added an extra $300,000 to, uh, to our pool. Um, so those projects have been submitted to town committee, or town council. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, was hoping we'd have the last minutes um, available in case there's any questions about specific projects. They don't have that um, at the ready, but can, can speak to any of them if you'd like in more detail at the next meeting, or you know, if you want, if you have questions about any of them now, I can, I can answer any that I remember off the top of my head. But it was a, it was a very good exercise. Um, happy to be part of that. And it was, I think, you know, lots of excitement for the projects that we had. And it really was a, a diverse pool as is, uh, required, but nonetheless, still a, a nice diverse pool of projects, which will uh, impact the town positively. Well, thanks for taking that on, Andrew. Um, and 
I'd we like, have I'd like the to Ag Commission. It's, oh, sorry. I'd like to report that it's snowing. <laughs> ah, I'm in my basement, so I have no idea with no windows. Uh, <laughs> I knew it was coming. Um, to the Ag Commission, Doug, are you appointed yet or, or what? Yeah, well, it seems like I can start participating, but they haven't had any meetings, so okay. no action. <laughs> All right, thank you. And the design review board, Tom? Uh, yeah, we had a few items that came up. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday. Um, one was just that the CARES Act um, is asking for these signage systems uh, that we talked about, um, information about um, COVID preparedness within Amherst. Um, these were required to be installed by the end of the year which was not something that was apparent to them at the time. So um, we had an emergency meeting to make sure that those are approved and those go through. So those should be installed by the end of the year um, with some, um, like I said, COVID preparedness information. And then the other thing that popped up was um, approving another, uh, an outdoor space for the Spoke restaurant on East Pleasant Street. Um, they are taking over the uh, Amherst copy space that was there and it's expanding all the way along. Oh my they goodness. Have two outdoor patios and they're going to take over the third one and put up potentially a new sign there. So just some exterior modifications, uh, which were all approved. That'll be the whole building now, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah that, that, that used to be like a sub place. Yeah. On it, one it end, was the best subplace. I, I know, I loved it. Place. Healthy portions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, sure. And then uh, the zoning subcommittee is. Um, I'm not sure why that's on the agenda, but. Do we need new members, Maria? At some point. Okay. <laughs> um, so report to the chair, I would uh, say that the next meeting, um, we're going to have someone from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that actually is an Amherst resident, Doug Hall, Douglas Hall. Uh, and he has been doing an amazing work with regard to the you know database kind of review of the effects of COVID and what we would expect the impacts to be long-term and the town council are invited to join us for that presentation. Uh, but it's very informative and it kind of gives us a perspective of what, what's next uh, through this. Um, and again, I, I hope you all appreciate it, but that'll be in our next uh, meeting, January, um, Jack, I believe that's January 20th, isn't 20, it? Oh, January 20th. Yeah. So not the next meeting. Oh, two meetings from now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and basically that, yeah, that's that's all I have. Uh and Chris. Well, I spilled the beans earlier about the um lack of appeal on the Amherst media. That was going to be my report of staff. Okay. But, um, I couldn't wait to tell you. <laughs> and I hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs> great but hey i i wish everyone uh you know happy hanukkah merry christmas happy new year we we're doing good work <laughs> and 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 chris uh and pam appreciate everything you guys do i mean it's oh, it's just you. so much on your plate i understand thank you so um happy holidays to everyone yeah, yeah, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah, and happy new year. Where's the new, new year? New thing. Happy new year. Happy new year. 2021. Let's yeah. flip the page. We should see <laughs> better. It's going to be Worst much better. Year ever. <laughs> it was an exciting year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too exciting. Yep. It's a good word, Jan. Oh. We yeah. had we had to learn a lot of new things, and we had to learn to be on the fly, right, Chris? We did. <laughs> <laughs> we did. 
<laughs> did. But you know what? Now we can work from home during the snow day tomorrow. Okay. Good. Oh, right. No, but that's not fair. Tomorrow. No more snow days. No more snow days. <laughs> and we didn't cancel the planning board meeting because of snow either. So. <laughs> Very good. All right. All right. All right we well, we'll see you all okay. next year. Stay safe. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Stop recording.